The Pirate's Own Book by Charles Elms Chapter 11 the bloody career and execution of Vincent Benavides, a pirate on the west coast of South America. Vincent Benavides was the son of the Gallier of Quirahu in the district of Conception. He was a man of ferocious manners and had been guilty of several murders. Upon the breaking out of the Revolutionary War, he entered the Patriot Army as a private soldier and was a sergeant of grenadiers at the time of the first Chilean Revolution. He, however, deserted to the Spaniards, and was taken prisoner in their service, when they sustained on the plains of Maypo on the 5th of April, 1818, that defeat which decided their fortunes in that part of America, and secured the independence of Chile. Benavides, his brother, and some other traitors to the Chilean cause, were sentenced to death, and brought forth in the plaza, or public square of Santiago, in order to be shot. Benavides, though terribly wounded by the discharge, was not killed, but he had the presence of mind to counterfeit death in so perfect a manner that the imposture was not suspected. The bodies of the traitors were not buried, but dragged away to a distance, and there left to be devoured by the galanazos or vultures. The sergeant who had the superintendence of this part of the ceremony had a personal hatred to Benavides on account of that person having murdered some of his relations, and to gratify his revenge he drew his sword and gave the dead body, as he thought, a severe gash in the side as they were dragging it along. The resolute Benavides had the fortitude to bear this also, without flinching or even showing the least indication of life, and one cannot help regretting that so determined a power of endurance had not been turned to a better purpose. Benavides lay like a dead man in the heap of carcasses until it became dark, and then, pierced with shot and gashed by the sword as he was, he crawled to a neighboring cottage, the inhabitants of which received him with the greatest kindness and attended him with the greatest care. The daring ruffian, who knew the value of his own talents and courage, being aware that General San Martin was planning the expedition to Peru, a service in which there would be much of desperation and danger, sent word to the general that he was alive, and invited him to a secret conference at midnight, in the same plaza in which it was believed Benavides had been shot. The signal agreed upon was that they should strike fire three times with their flints, as that was not likely to be answered by any but the proper party, and yet was not calculated to awaken suspicion. San Martin, alone, and provided with a brace of pistols, met the desperado, and after a long conference it was agreed that Benavides should, in the meantime, go out against the Arakan Indians, but that he should hold himself in readiness to proceed to Peru, when the expedition suited. Having procured the requisite passports, he proceeded to Chile, where, having again diverted the Chileans, he succeeded in persuading the commander of the Spanish troops that he had force sufficient to carry on the war against Chile, and the commander in consequence retired to Valdivia, and left Benavides commander of the whole frontier on the Bio Bio. Having thus cleared the coast of the Spanish commander, he went over to the Arakans, or rather he formed a band of armed robbers who committed every cruelty, and were guilty of every perfidy in the south of Chile. Wherever Benavides came, his footsteps were marked with blood, and the old men, the women, and the children were butchered, lest they should give notice of his motions. When he had rendered himself formidable by land, he resolved to be equally powerful upon the sea. He equipped a corsair with instructions to capture the vessels of all nations, and as Arucan is directly opposite the island of Santa Maria, where vessels put in for refreshment, after having doubled Cape Horn, his situation was well adapted for his purpose. He was but too successful. The first of his prizes was the American ship Hero, which he took by surprise in the night. The second was the Herculia, a brig belonging to the same country. While the unconscious crew were proceeding, as usual, to catch seals on this island, laying about three leagues from the mainland of Aruca, an armed body of men rushed from the woods, and overpowering them, tied their hands behind them, and left them under a guard on the beach. These were no other than the pirates, who now took the Herculia's own boats, and going on board, surprised the captain and four of his crew, who had remained to take care of the brig, 
and having brought off the prisoners from the beach, threw them all into the hold, closing the hatches over them. They then tripped the vessel's anchor, and sailing over in triumph to Aruca, were received by Benavides, with a salute of musketry fired under the Spanish flag, which it was their chief's pleasure to hoist on that day. In the course of the next night, Benavides ordered the captain and his crew to be removed to a house on shore, at some distance from the town, then taking them out, one by one, he stripped and pillaged them of all they possessed, threatening them the whole time with drawn swords and loaded muskets. Next morning he paid the prisoners a visit and ordered them to the capital, called together the principal people of the town, and desired each to select one as a servant. The captain and four others, not happening to please the fancy of any one, Benavides, after saying he would himself take charge of the captain, gave directions, on pain of instant death, that some one should hold themselves responsible for the other prisoners. Some days after this they were called together, and required to serve as soldiers in the pirate's army, an order to which they consented, knowing well by what they had already seen that the consequence of refusal would be fatal. Benavides, though unquestionably a ferocious savage, was, nevertheless, a man of resource, full of activity and of considerable energy of character. He converted the whale-spears and harpoons into lances for his cavalry, and halberts for his sergeants, and out of the sails he made trousers for half of his army. The carpenters he set to work making baggage carts and repairing his boats. The armorers he kept perpetually at work, mending muskets and making pikes, managing in this way to turn the skill of every one of his prisoners to some useful account. He treated the officers, too, not unkindly, allowed them to live in his house, and was very anxious on all occasions to have their advice respecting the equipment of his troops. Upon one occasion, when walking with the captain of the Herculia, he remarked that his army was now almost complete in every respect, except in one essential particular, and it cut him, he said, to the soul, to think of such a deficiency. He had no trumpets for his cavalry, and added that it was utterly impossible to make the fellows believe themselves dragoons, unless they heard a blast in their ears at every turn, and neither men nor horses would ever do their duty properly, if not roused to it by the sound of a trumpet. In short, he declared, some device must be hit upon to supply this equipment. The captain, willing to ingratiate himself with a pirate, after a little reflection, suggested to him that trumpets might easily be made of copper sheets on the bottoms of the vessels he had taken. "'Very true,' cried the delighted chief. "'How came I not to think of that before?' Instantly all hands were employed in ripping off the copper, and the armorers being set to work under his personal superintendence, the whole camp, before night, resounded with the warlike blasts of the cavalry." The captain of the ship, who had given him the brilliant idea of the copper trumpets, had by these means so far won upon his good will and confidence as to be allowed a considerable range to walk on. He, of course, was always looking out for some plan of escape, and at length an opportunity occurring, he, with the mate of the ocean and nine of his crew, seized two whaleboats, imprudently left on the banks of the river, and rowed off. Before quitting the shore, they took the precaution of staving all the other boats to prevent pursuit, and accordingly, though their escape was immediately discovered, they succeeded in getting so much the start of the people whom Benavides sent in pursuit of them, that they reached St. Mary's Island in safety. Here they caught several seals upon which they subsisted very miserably till they reached Valparaiso. It was in consequence of their report of Benavides' proceedings, made to Sir Thomas Hardy, the commander-in-chief, that he deemed it proper to send a ship to rescue, if possible, the remaining unfortunate captives at Aruca. Benavides, having manned the Herculia, it suited the mate, the captain and crew being detained as hostages, to sail with the brig to Chile, and seek aid from the Spanish governor. The Herculia returned with a twenty-four-pounder, two field-pieces, eleven Spanish officers, and twenty soldiers, together with the most flattering letters and congratulations to the worthy ally of his most catholic majesty soon after this he captured the perseverance english whaler and the american brig ocean bound for lima with several thousand stand of arms on board the captain of the herculia with the mate of the ocean and several men after suffering great hardships landed at valparaiso and gave notice of the proceedings of benavides 
and in consequence Sir Thomas Hardy directed Captain Hall to proceed to Aruka with the convoy to set the captives free if possible. It was for the accomplishment of this service that Captain Hall sailed from Valparaiso, and he called at Conception on his way, in order to glean information respecting the pirate. Here the captain ascertained that Benavides was between two considerable bodies of Chilean force, on the Chilean side of the Bio Bio, and one of those bodies between him and the river. Having to wait two days at Conception for information, Captain Hall occupied them in observing the place. The country he describes as green and fertile, and having none of the dry and desert character of the environs of Valparaiso, abundance of vegetables, wood, and also coals are found on the shores of the bay. On the 12th of October the captain heard of the defeat of Benavides, and his flight alone across the Bio Bio into the Arucan country and also that two of the Americans, whom he had taken with him, had made their escape, and were on board the Chacabuco. As these were the only persons who could give Captain Hall information respecting the prisoners of whom he was in quest, he set out in search of the vessel, and after two days' search found her at anchor near the island of Mocha. From thence he learned that the captain of the ocean, with several English and American seamen, had been left at Aruca when Benavides went on his expedition, and he sailed for that place immediately. He was too late, however. The Chilean forces had already made a successful attack, and the Indians had fled, setting fire to the town and the ships. The Indians, who were in league with the Chileans, were every way as wild as those who arrayed themselves under Benavides. Captain Hall, upon his return to Conception, though dissuaded from it by the governor, visited the Indian encampment. When the captain and his associates entered the courtyard, they observed a party seated on the ground, round a great tub of wine, who hailed their entrance with loud shouts, or rather yells, and boisterously demanded their business, to all appearance very little pleased with the interruption. The interpreter became alarmed, and wished them to retire, but this the captain thought imprudent, as each man had his long spear close at hand, resting against the eaves of the house. Had they attempted to escape, they must have been taken, or possibly sacrificed, by these drunken savages. As their best chance seemed to lie in treating them without any show of distrust, they advanced to the circle with a good-humoured confidence, which appeased them considerably. One of the party rose and embraced them in the Indian fashion, which they had learned from the gentlemen who had been prisoners with Benavides. After the ceremony they roared out to them to sit down on the ground, and with the most boisterous hospitality, insisted on their drinking with them a request which they cheerfully complied with. Their anger soon vanished, and was succeeded by mirth and satisfaction, which speedily became as outrageous as their displeasure had been at first. Seizing a favorable opportunity, Captain Hall stated his wish to have an interview with their chief, upon which a message was sent to him, but he did not think fit to show himself for a considerable time, during which they remained with the party round the tub, who continued swilling their wine like so many hogs. Their heads soon became affected, and their obstreperous mirth increasing every minute, the situation of the strangers became by no means agreeable. At length Penelio's door opened, and the chief made his appearance. He did not condescend, however, to cross the threshold, but leaned against the doorpost to prevent falling, being by some degrees more drunk than any of his people. A more finished picture of a savage cannot be conceived. He was a tall, broad-shouldered man, with a prodigiously large head and a square-shaped bloated face, from which peeped out two very small eyes, partly hid by an immense superfluity of black, coarse, oily straight hair, covering his cheeks, hanging over his shoulders, and rendering his head somewhat the shape and size of a beehive. Over his shoulders was thrown a poncho of coarse blanket stuff. He received them very gruffly, and appeared irritated and sulky at having been disturbed. He was still more offended when he learned that they wished to see his captive. They in vain endeavored to explain their real views, but he grunted out his answer in a tone and manner which showed them plainly that he neither did nor wished to understand them. Whilst in conversation with Penelio, they stole an occasional glance at his apartment. By the side of the fire burning in the middle of the floor was seated a young Indian woman, with long black hair reaching to the ground. This, they conceived, could be no other than one of the unfortunate persons they were in search of, and they were somewhat disappointed to observe that the lady was neither in tears nor apparently very miserable. 
They therefore came away impressed with the unsentimental idea that the amiable Penelio had already made some impression on her young heart. Two Indians, who were not so drunk as the rest, followed them to the outside of the court, and told them that several foreigners had been taken by the Chileans in the battle near Chilean, and were now safe. The interpreter hinted to them that this was probably invented by these cunning people on hearing their questions in the court, but he advised them, as a matter of policy, to give them each a piece of money, and to get away as far as they could. Captain Hall returned to Conception on the 23rd of October, reached Valparaiso on the 26th, and in two weeks thereafter the men of whom he was in search made their appearance. The bloody career of Benavides now drew near to a close. The defeat on the Chilean side of the Bio Bio, and the burning of Aruca with the loss of his vessels, he never recovered. At length, in the end of December, 1821, discovering the miserable state to which he was reduced, he entreated the intendant of Conception that he might be received on giving himself up along with his partisans. This generous chief accepted his offer, and informed the supreme government, but in the meantime Benavides embarked in a launch at the mouth of the river Lebo, and fled, with the intention of joining a division of the enemy's army, which he supposed to be at some one of the ports on the south coast of Peru. It was indeed absurd to expect any good faith from such an intriguer, for in his letters at this time he offered his services to Chile and promised fidelity, while his real intention was still to follow the enemy. He finally left the unhappy province of Conception, the theatre of so many miserable scenes, overwhelmed with the misery which he had caused, without ever recollecting that it was in that province that he had first drawn his breath. His despair in the boat made his conduct insupportable to those who accompanied him, and they rejoiced when they were obliged to put into the harbour of Tapocalma in search of water of which they had run short. He was now arrested by some patriotic individuals. From the notorious nature of his crimes alone, even the most impartial stranger would have condemned him to the last punishment. But the supreme government wished to hear what he had to say for himself, and ordered him to be tried according to the laws. It appearing on his trial that he had placed himself beyond the laws of society, such punishment was awarded him as any one of his crimes deserved. As a pirate he merited death, and as a destroyer of whole towns it became necessary to put him to death in such a manner as might satisfy outraged humanity, and terrify others who should dare to imitate him. In pursuance of the sentence passed upon him, he was dragged from the prison in a pannier tied to the tail of a mule, and was hanged in the great square. His head and hands were afterwards cut off, in order to their being placed upon high poles, to point out the places of his horrid crimes, Santa Juana, Tarpalanca, and Aruca. End of chapter 11 The Pirate's Own Book by Charles Elms Chapter 12 The Life of Captain Davis With an account of his surprising the fort at Gambia Davis was born in Monmouthshire, and from a boy trained to the sea. His last voyage from England was in the sloop Cadogan from Bristol, in the character of chief mate. This vessel was captured by the pirate England upon the Guinea coast, whose companions plundered the crew, and murdered the captain, as is related in England's life. Upon the death of Captain Skinner, Davis pretended that he was urged by England to become a pirate, but that he resolutely refused. He added that England, pleased with his conduct, had made him captain in room of Skinner, giving him a sealed paper which he was not to open until he was in a certain latitude, and then expressly to follow the given directions. When he arrived at the appointed place, he collected the whole crew, and solemnly read his sealed instructions, which contained a generous grant of the ship and all her stores to Davis and his crew, requesting them to go to Brazil and dispose of the cargo to the best advantage, and make an equal division of the money. Davis then commanded the crew to signify whether they were inclined to follow that mode of life, when, to his astonishment and chagrin, the majority positively refused, then, in a transport of rage, he desired them to go where they would. Knowing that part of the cargo was consigned to merchants in Barbados, they directed their course to that place. When arrived there, they informed the merchants of the unfortunate death of Skinner, and of the proposal which had been made to them. 
Davis was accordingly seized and committed to prison, but he having never been in the pirate's service, nothing could be proved to condemn him, and he was discharged without a trial. Convinced that he could never hope for employment in that quarter after this detection, he went to the island of Providence, which he knew to be a rendezvous for pirates. Upon his arrival there, he was grievously disappointed, because the pirates who frequented that place had just accepted of his majesty's pardon, and had surrendered. Captain Rogers, having equipped two sloops for trade, Davis obtained employment in one of these, called the Buck. They were laden with European goods to a considerable value, which they were to sell or exchange with the French and Spanish. They first touched at the island of Martinique, belonging to the French, and Davis, knowing that many of the men were formerly in the pirate's service, enticed them to seize the master, and to run off with the sloop. When they had effected their purpose, they hailed the other ship, in which they knew that there were many hands ripe for rebellion, and, coming to, the greater part joined Davis. Those who did not choose to adhere to them were allowed to remain in the other sloop and continue their course, after Davis had pillaged her of what things he pleased. In full possession of the vessel, and stores and goods, a large bowl of punch was made. Under its exhilarating influence it was proposed to choose a commander, and to form their future mode of policy. The election was soon over, and a large majority of legal votes were in favour of Davis, and, no scrutiny demanded, Davis was declared duly elected. He then drew up a code of laws to which he himself swore, and required the same bond of alliance from the rest of the crew. He then addressed them in a short and appropriate speech, the substance of which was a proclamation of war with the whole world. They next consulted what part would be most convenient to clean the vessel, and it was resolved to repair to Coxon's Hole at the east end of the island of Cuba, where they could remain in perfect security, as the entrance was so narrow that one ship could keep out a hundred. They, however, had no small difficulty in cleaning their vessel, as there was no carpenter among them. They performed that laborious task in the best manner they could, and then made to the north side of Hispaniola. The first sail they met with was a French ship of twelve guns, which they captured, and while they were plundering her, another appeared in view. Inquiring of the Frenchmen, they learned that she was a ship of twenty-four guns and sixty men. Davis proposed to his crew to attack her, assuring them that she would prove a rich prize. This appeared to the crew such a hazardous enterprise that they were rather adverse to the measure, but he acquainted them that he had conceived a stratagem that he was confident would succeed. They might, therefore, safely leave the matter to his management. He then commenced chase, and ordered his prize to do the same. Being a better sailor, he soon came up with the enemy, and showed his black colours. With no small surprise at his insolence in coming so near them, they commanded him to strike. He replied that he was disposed to give them employment until his companion came up, who was able to contend with them. Meanwhile, assuring them that, if they did not strike to him, it would most certainly fare the worse for them, then giving them a broadside, he received the same in return. When the other pirate ship drew near, they, according to the directions of Davis, appeared upon decks in white shirts, which making an appearance of numbers, the Frenchmen were intimidated, and struck. Davis ordered the captain with twenty of his men to come on board, and they were all put in irons except the captain. He then dispatched four of his men to the other ship, and calling aloud to them, desired that his compliment should be given to the captain, with a request to send a sufficient number of hands to go on board their new prize, to see what they had got in her. At the same time he gave them a written paper with their proper instructions, even to nail up the small guns, to take out all the, the arms and powder, and to go every man on board the new prize. When his men were on board her, he ordered the greater part of the prisoners to be removed into the empty vessels, and by this means secured himself from any attempt to recover their ship. During three days these three vessels sailed in company, but finding that his late prize was a heavy sailor, he emptied her of everything that he stood in need of, and then restored her to the captain with all his men. The French captain was so much enraged at being thus miserably deceived, 
that upon the discovery of this stratagem he would have thrown himself overboard had not his men prevented him. Captain Davis then formed the resolution of parting with the other prize ship also, and soon afterwards steered northward and took a Spanish sloop. He next directed his course towards the western islands, and from Cape de Verde Islands cast anchor at St. Nicholas and hoisted English colours. The Portuguese supposed that he was a privateer, and Davis going on shore was hospitably received, and they traded with him for such articles as they found most advantageous. He remained here five weeks, and he and half of his crew visited the principal town of the island. Davis, from his appearing in the dress of a gentleman, was greatly caressed by the Portuguese, and nothing was spared to entertain and render him and his men happy. Having amused themselves during a week, they returned to the ship, and allowed the other half of the crew to visit the capital, and enjoy themselves in like manner. Upon their return, they cleaned their ship and put to sea, but four of the men were so captivated with the ladies and the luxuries of the place, that they remained in the island, and one of them married and settled there. Davis now sailed for Bonavista, and perceived nothing in that harbour, steered for the Isle of May. Arriving there, he found several vessels in the harbour, and plundered them of whatever he found necessary. He also received a considerable reinforcement of men, the greater part of whom entered willingly into the piratical service. He likewise made free with one of the ships, equipped her for his own purpose, and called her the King James. Davis next proceeded to St. Jago, to take in water. Davis, with some of the others, going on shore to seek water, the governor came to inquire who they were and expressed his suspicion of their being pirates. Upon this, Davis seemed highly affronted, and expressed his displeasure in the most polite but determined manner. He, however, hastened on board, informed his men, and suggested the possibility of surprising the fort during the night. Accordingly, all his men being well armed, they advanced to the assault, and from the carelessness of the guards they were in the garrison before the inhabitants were alarmed. Upon the discovery of their danger, they took shelter in the governor's house, and fortified it against the pirates. But the latter, throwing in some grando shells, ruined the furniture, and killed several people. The alarm was circulated in the morning, and the country assembled to attack them. But unwilling to stand a siege, the pirates dismounted the gun, pillaged the fort, and fled to their ships. When at sea, they mustered their hands, and found that they were seventy strong, then they consulted among themselves what course they should steer, and were divided in opinion. But by a majority it was carried to sail for Gambia, on the coast of Guinea. Of this opinion was the captain, who having been employed in that trade was acquainted with the coast, and informed his companions that there was always a large quantity of money deposited in that castle, and he was confident, if the matter was entrusted to him, that he should successfully storm that fort. From their experience of his former prudence and courage, they cheerfully submitted to his direction, in the full assurance of success. Arrived at Gambia, he ordered all his men below, except just so many as were necessary to work the vessel, that those from the fort, seeing so few hands, might have no suspicion that she was any other than a trading vessel. He then ran under the fort and cast anchor, and, having ordered out the boat, manned with six men, indifferently dressed, he, with the master and doctor, dressed themselves like gentlemen, in order that the one party might look like foremastmen, and the other like merchants. In rowing ashore he instructed his men what to say if any questions were put to them by the garrison. On reaching land the party were conducted by a file of musketeers into the fort, and kindly received by the governor, who inquired what they were and whence they came. They replied that they were from Liverpool, and bound for the river Senegal, to trade for gum and elephant's teeth, but that they were chased on that coast by two French men of war, and narrowly escaped being taken. We were now disposed, continued Davis, to make the best of our voyage, and would willingly trade here for slaves. The governor then inquired what were the principal articles of their cargo. They replied that they were iron and plate, which were necessary articles in that place. The governor then said that he would give them slaves for all their cargo, and asked if they had any European liquor on board. 
They answered that they had a little for their own use, but that he should have a hamper of it. He then treated them with the greatest civility, and desired them all to dine with him. Davis answered that as he was commander of the vessel, it would be necessary for him to go down to see if she were properly moored, and to give some other directions, but that these gentlemen might stay, and he would return before dinner, and bring the hamper with him. While in the fort, his eyes were keenly employed to discover the position of the arms, and how the fort might most successfully be surprised. He discovered that there was a sentry standing near a guard-house, in which there were a quantity of arms heaped up in a corner, and that a considerable number of small arms were in the governor's hall. When he went on board, he ordered some hands on board a sloop lying at anchor, lest, hearing any bustle, they should come to the aid of the castle. Then, desiring his men to avoid too much liquor, and to be ready when he should hoist the flag from the walls to come to his assistance, he proceeded to the castle. Having taken these precautions, and formed these arrangements, he ordered every man who was to accompany him to arm himself with two pairs of pistols, which he himself also did, concealed under their clothes. He then directed them to go to the guard-room, and fall into conversation, and immediately upon his firing a pistol out of the governor's window, to shut the men up and secure the arms in the guard-room. When Davis arrived, dinner not being ready, the governor proposed that they should pass the time in making a bowl of punch. Davis's boatswain, attending him, had an opportunity of visiting all parts of the house and observing their strength. He whispered his intelligence to his master, who, being surrounded by his own friends, and seeing the governor unattended by any of his retinue, presented a pistol to the breast of the latter, informing him that he was a dead man unless he should surrender the fort and all its riches. The governor, thus taken by surprise, was compelled to submit, for Davis took down all the pistols that hung in the hall and loaded them. He then fired his pistol out of the window. His men flew like lions, presenting their pistols to the soldiers, and while some carried out the arms, the rest secured the military and shut them all up in the guard-house, placing a guard on the door. Then one of them struck the Union flag on top of the castle, which the men from the vessel perceiving rushed to the combat, and in an instant were in possession of the castle, without tumult or bloodshed. Davis then harangued the soldiers, many of whom enlisted with him, and those who declined he put on board the small ships, and to prevent the necessity of a guard, or the possibility of escape, carried off the sails, rigging, and cables. That day, being spent in feasting and rejoicing, the castle saluting the ship, and the ship the castle, on the day following they proceeded to examine the contents of their prize. They, however, were greatly disappointed in their expectations, a large sum of money having been sent off a few days before. But they found money, to the amount of about two thousand pounds in gold, and many valuable articles of different kinds. They carried on board their vessel whatever they deemed useful, gave several articles to the captain and crew of the small vessel, and allowed them to depart, while they dismounted the guns and demolished the fortifications. After doing all the mischief that their vicious minds could possibly devise, they weighed anchor, but in the meantime, perceiving a small sail bearing towards them with all possible speed, they hastened to prepare for her reception and made towards her. Upon her near approach, they discovered that she was a French pirate of fourteen guns and sixty-four men, and one half French, the other half Negroes. The Frenchmen were in high expectation of a rich prize, but when he came nearer, he suspected, from the number of her guns and men, that she was a small English man-of-war. He determined, notwithstanding, upon the bold attempt of boarding her, and immediately fired a gun, and hoisted his black colours. Davis immediately returned the compliment. The Frenchman was highly gratified at this discovery. Both hoisted out their boats, and congratulated each other. Mutual civilities and good offices passed, and the French captain proposed to Davis to sail down the coast with him, in order to look out for a better ship, assuring him that the very first that could be captured should be his, as he was always willing to encourage an industrious brother. They first touched at Sierra Leone, where they espied a large vessel, and Davis, being the swifter sailor, came first up with him. 
he was not a little surprised that she did not endeavour to make off, and began to suspect her strength. When he came back alongside her, she fired a whole broadside, and hoisted black colours. Davis did the same, and fired a gun to leeward. The satisfaction of these brothers in iniquity was mutual, at having thus acquired so much additional strength, and ability to undertake more formidable adventures. Two days were devoted to mirth and song, and upon the third, Davis and Cochlin, the captain of the new confederate, agreed to go in the French pirate ship to attack the fort. When they approached, the men in the fort, apprehensive of their character and intentions, fired all the guns upon them at once. The ship returned the fire, and afforded employment until the two other ships arrived, when the men in the fort, seeing such a number on board, lost courage, and abandoned the fort to the mercy of the robbers. They took possession, remained there seven weeks, and cleaned their vessels. They then called a council of war, to deliberate concerning future undertakings, when it was resolved to sail down the coast in company, and for the greater regularity and grandeur, Davis was chosen Commodore. That dangerous enemy, strong drink, had well nigh, however, sown the seeds of discord among these affectionate brethren. But Davis, alike prepared for counsel or for war, address them to the following purport. Hear ye, you Cochlin and Le Bois, which was the name of the French captain, I find by strengthening you I have put a rod into your hands to whip myself, but I am still able to deal with you both. However, since we met in love, let us part in love, for I find that three of a trade can never agree long together. Upon this the other two went on board of their respective ships, and steered different courses. Davis held down the coast, and reaching Cape Apollonia, he captured three vessels, two English and one Scottish, plundered them, and allowed them to proceed. In five days after he met with a Dutchman of thirty guns and ninety men. She gave Davis a broadside, and killed nine of his men. A desperate engagement ensued, which continued from one o'clock at noon until nine next morning, when the Dutchman struck. Davis equipped her for the pirate service, and called her the Rover. With his two ships he sailed for the bay of Anamaboa, which he entered upon noon, and took several vessels which were waiting to take in negroes, gold, and elephant's teeth. Davis made a present of one of these vessels to the Dutch captain and his crew, and allowed them to go in quest of their fortune. When the fort had intelligence that they were pirates, they fired at them, but without any effect. Davis fired also, and hoisted the black colours, but deemed it prudent to depart. The next day, after he left Ananmaboa, the man at the masthead discovered a sail. It may be proper to inform our readers that according to the laws of pirates, the man who first discovered a vessel is entitled to the best pair of pistols in the ship, and such is the honour attached to these, that a pair of them has been known to sell for thirty pounds. Davis pursued that vessel which, being between him and the shore, laboured hard to run aground. Davis, perceiving this, got between her and the land, and fired a broadside at her, when she immediately struck. She proved to be a very rich prize, having on board the governor of Accra, with all his substance going to Holland. There was in money to the amount of fifteen thousand pounds, beside a large quantity of merchant goods and other valuable articles. Before they reached the Isle of Princes, the St. James sprang a leak, so that the men and the valuable articles were removed into Davis's own ship. When he came in sight of the fort, he hoisted English colours. The Portuguese, seeing a large ship sailing towards the shore, sent a sloop to discover her character and destination. Davis informed them that he was an English man-of-war, sent out in search of some pirates which they had heard were in this quarter. Upon this he was piloted into the port, and anchored below the guns at the fort. The governor was happy to have Englishmen in his harbour, and to do honour to Davis sent down a file of musketeers to escort him to the fort, while Davis, the more to cover his design, ordered nine men, according to the custom of the English, to row him on shore. Davis also took the opportunity of cleaning and preparing all things for renewing his operations. 
He, however, could not contentedly leave the fort without receiving some of the riches of the island. He formed a scheme to accomplish his purpose, and communicated the same to his men. His design was to make the governor a present of a few negroes in return for his kindness, then to invite him, with a few of his principal men and friars belonging to the island, to dine on board his ship, and secure them all in irons until each of them would give a large ransom. They were accordingly invited, and very readily consented to go, and, deeming themselves honoured by his attention, all that were invited would certainly have gone on board. Fortunately, however, for them, a negro who was privy to the horrible plan of Davis swam on shore during the night, and gave information of the danger to the governor. Retreat of the Pirates and Death of Captain Davis the governor occupied the whole night in strengthening the defences and posting the men in the most advantageous places. Soon after daybreak the pirates, with Captain Davis at their head, were discovered landing from the boats, and quickly marched across the open space towards the fort. A brisk fire was opened upon them from the fort, which they returned in a spirited manner. At length a hand-grenade thrown from the wooden veranda of the fort killed three of the pirates but several of the Portuguese were killed. The veranda of the fort, being of wood and very dry, it was set fire to by the pirates. This was a great advantage to the attacking party, who could now distinguish those in the fort without being so clearly seen themselves. But at this moment Captain Davis fell, mortally wounded by a musket-ball in his belly. The fall of their chief, and the determined resistance of those in the fort, checked the impetuosity of the assailants. They hesitated, and at last retreated, bearing away with them their wounded commander. The Portuguese cheered, and led on by the governor now became the assailants. Still the pirates' retreat was orderly. They fired and retired, rank behind rank, successively. They kept the Portuguese at bay until they had arrived at the boats, when a charge was made and a severe conflict ensued but the pirates had lost too many men, and without their captain felt dispirited. As they lifted Davis into the boat in his dying agonies, he fired his pistol at his pursuers. They now pulled with all their might to escape from the muskets of the Portuguese, who followed them along the banks of the river, annoying them in their retreat to the vessel, and those on board, who expected to hoist in treasure, had to receive naught for their wounded comrades and dead commander. End of chapter 12 The Pirate's Own Book by Charles Elms Chapter 13 Authentic History of the Malay Pirates of the Indian Ocean with a narrative of the expedition against the inhabitants of Kuala Batu commanded by Commodore Downs. A glance at the map of the East India Islands will convince us that this region of the globe must, from its natural configuration and locality, be peculiarly liable to become the seat of piracy. These islands form an immense cluster, lying as if it were in the high road which connects the commercial nations of Europe and Asia with each other, affording a hundred fastnesses from which to waylay the traveler. A large proportion of the population is at the same time confined to the coasts or the estuaries of rivers. They are fishermen and mariners, they are barbarous and poor, therefore rapacious, faithless, and sanguinary. These are circumstances, it must be confessed, which militate strongly to beget a piratical character. It is not surprising, then, that the Malay should have been notorious for their depredations from our first acquaintance with them. Among the tribes of the Indian islands, the most noted for their piracies are, of course, the most idle, and the least industrious, and particularly such as are unaccustomed to follow agriculture or trade as regular pursuits. The agricultural tribes of Java, and many of Sumatra, never commit piracy at all, and the most civilized inhabitants of Celebes are very little addicted to this vice. Among the most confirmed pirates are the true Malays, inhabiting the small islands about the eastern extremity of the Straits of Malacca, and those lying between Sumatra and Borneo, down to Bilitin and Cavamatir. 
Still more noted than these are the inhabitants of certain islands situated between Borneo and the Philippines, of whom the most desperate and enterprising are the Sulus and Illinums, the former inhabiting a well-known group of islands of the same name, and the latter being one of the most numerous nations of the great island of Magandondo. The depredations of the proper Malays extend from Junkceylon to Java, through its whole coast as far as Grip to Papir and Kriti, in Borneo and the western coast of Celebes. In another direction they infest the coasting trade of the Cochin Chinese and Siamese nations in the Gulf of Siam, finding sail for their booty and shelter for themselves in the ports of Tringham, Kalantan, and Sahang. The most noted piratical stations of these people are the small islands about Lingin and Rio, particularly Galang, Tamiang, and Mafar. The chief of this last has seventy or eighty proas fit to undertake piratical expeditions. The Sulu pirates chiefly confine their depredations to the Philippine Islands, which they have continued to infest with little interruption for nearly three centuries. In open defiance of the Spanish authorities, and the numerous establishments maintained to check them. The piracies of the Illinoons, on the contrary, are widely extended, being carried on all the way from their native country to the Spice Islands on one side, and to the Straits of Malacca on the other. In these last, indeed, they have formed for the last few years two permanent establishments. One of these, situated on Sumatra, near Indragiri, is called Ridi. The other, a small island on the coast of Linga, is named Salangut. Besides those who are avowed pirates, it ought to be particularly noticed that a great number of the Malayan princes must be considered as accessories to their crimes, for they afford them protection, contribute to their outfit, and often share in their booty, so that a piratical proa is too commonly more welcome in their harbors than a fair trader. The Malay piratical proas are from six to eight tons burden, and run from six to eight fathoms in length. They carry from one to two small guns with commonly four swivels or rantakas to each side, and a crew of from twenty to thirty men. When they engage, they put up a strong bulwark of thick plank. The Illinoon proas are much larger and more formidable, and commonly carry from four to six guns and a proportionable number of swivels, and have not unfrequently a double bulwark covered with buffalo hides. Their crews consist of from forty to eighty men. Both, of course, are provided with spears, krises, and as many firearms as they can procure. Their modes of attack are cautious and cowardly, for plunder and not fame is their object. They lie concealed under the land until they find a fit object and opportunity. The time chosen is when a vessel runs aground or is becalmed in the interval between the land and sea breezes. A vessel under way is seldom or never attacked. Several of the marauders attack together and station themselves under the bows and quarters of a ship when she has no longer steerage way and is incapable of pointing her guns. The action continues often for several hours, doing very little mischief, but when the crews are exhausted with a defense or have expended their ammunition, the pirates take this opportunity of boarding in a mass. This may suggest the best means of defense. A ship, when attacked during a calm, ought, perhaps, rather to stand on the defensive and wait, if possible, the setting in of the sea breeze than attempt any active operations which would only fatigue the crew and disable them from making the necessary defense when boarding is attempted. Boarding netting, pikes, and pistols appear to afford effectual security, and, indeed, we conceive that a vessel thus defended by resolute crews of Europeans or Americans stand but little danger from any open attack of pirates whatsoever, for their guns are so ill-served that neither the hull or the rigging of a vessel can receive much damage from them, however much protracted the contest. The pirates are upon the whole extremely impartial in the selection of their prey, making little choice between natives and strangers, giving always, however, a natural preference to the most timid and the most easily overcome. When an expedition is undertaken by the Malay pirates, they range themselves under the banner of some piratical chief noted for his courage and conduct. The native prince of the place where it is prepared supplies the adventurers with arms, ammunition, and opium, 
and claims as his share of the plunder the female captives, the cannon, and one-third of all the rest of the booty. In November 1827, a principal chief of pirates named Sindana made a descent upon Mamudgu with forty-five proas, burnt three-fourths of the Kampong, driving the Raja with his family among the mountains. Some scores of men were killed and three hundred made prisoners, besides women and children to half that amount. In December following, when I was there, the people were slowly returning from the hills, but had not yet attempted to rebuild the Kampong, which lay in ashes. During my stay here, ten weeks, the place was visited by two other piratical chiefs, one of which was from Kaili, the other from Mandar Point under Bem Bowen, who appeared to have charge of the whole. Between them, they had 134 proas of all sizes. Among the most desperate and successful pirates of the present day, Raga is most distinguished. He is dreaded by people of all denominations, and universally known as the Prince of Pirates. For more than seventeen years this man has carried on a system of piracy to an extent never before known. His expeditions and enterprises would fill a large volume. They have invariably been marked with singular cunning and intelligence, barbarity and reckless inattention to the shedding of human blood. He has emissaries everywhere and has intelligence of the best description. It was about the year 1813 Raga commenced operations on a large scale. In that year he cut off three English vessels, killing the captains with his own hands. So extensive were his depredations about that time that a proclamation was issued from Batavia declaring the east coast of Borneo to be under strict blockade. Two British sloops of war scoured the coast, one of which, the Elk, Captain Reynolds, was attacked during the night by Raga's own proa, who unfortunately was not on board at the time. This proa, which Raga personally commanded, and the loss of which he frequently laments, carried eight guns and was full of his best men. A European vessel was faintly descried about three o'clock one foggy morning. The rain fell in torrents, the time and weather were favorable circumstances for a surprise, and the commander, determined to distinguish himself in the absence of the Raja Raga, gave directions to close, fire the guns, and board. He was the more confident of success as the European vessel was observed to keep away out of the proper course on approaching her. On getting within about a hundred fathoms of the elk, they fired their broadside, gave a loud shout, and with their long oars pulled towards their prey. The sound of a drum beating to quarters no sooner struck the ear of the astonished melees than they endeavored to get away. It was too late. The ports were opened, and a broadside, accompanied by three British cheers, gave sure indications of their fate. The captain hailed the elk and would fain persuade him it was a mistake. It was indeed a mistake, and one not to be rectified by the Malayan explanation. The pro was sunk by repeated broadsides, and the commanding officer refused to pick up any of the people, who with the exception of five were drowned. These, after floating four days on some spars, were picked up by a forgotten proa, and told the story to Raga, who swore a new destruction to every European he should henceforth take. This desperado has for upwards of seventeen years been the terror of the Straits of Makassar, during which period he has committed the most extensive and dreadful excesses, sparing no one. Few respectable families along the coast of Borneo and Celebes but have to complain of the loss of a proa or of some number of their race. He is not more universally dreaded than detested. It is well known that he has cut off and murdered the crews of more than forty European vessels, which have either been wrecked on the coasts or entrusted themselves in native ports. It is his boast that twenty of the commanders have fallen by his hands. The western coast of Celebes, for about two hundred and fifty miles, is absolutely lined with proas, belonging principally to three considerable rajas, who act in conjunction with raga and other pirates. Their proas may be seen in clusters of from fifty, eighty, and one hundred. At Sediano I counted one hundred and forty-seven laying on the sand at high water mark in parallel rows and kept in a horizontal position by poles completely ready for the sea. Immediately behind them are the campongs, in which are the crews. Here likewise are kept the sails, gunpowder, etc., necessary for their equipment. 
on the very summits of the mountains which in many parts rise abruptly from the sea may be distinguished innumerable huts here reside people who are constantly on the lookout a vessel within ten miles of the shore will not probably perceive a single proa yet in less than two hours if the tide be high she may be surrounded by some hundreds should the water be low they will push off during the night signals are made from mountain to mountain along the coast with the utmost rapidity during the daytime by flags attached to long bamboos at night by fires each chief sends forth his proas the crews of which in hazardous cases are infuriated with opium when they will most assuredly take the vessel if she be not better provided than most merchantmen mr dalton who went to the Pergotten river in eighteen thirty says Whilst I remained here there were seventy-one proas of considerable sizes, thirty-nine of which were professed pirates. They were anchored off the point of a small promontory on which the Raja has an establishment and bazaar. The largest of these proas belonged to Raga, who received by the fleet of proas in which I came his regular supplies of arms and ammunition from Singapore. Here nestle the principal pirates, and Raga holds his headquarters. His grand depot was a few miles farther up. Raja Agi Boda himself generally resides some distance up a small river which runs eastward of the point. Near his habitation stands the principal bazaar, which would be a great curiosity for a European to visit if he could only manage to return, which very few have. The Raga gave me a pressing invitation to spend a couple of days at his country house, but all the Bugis's Nakodas strongly dissuaded me from such an attempt. I soon discovered the cause of their apprehension. They were jealous of Agibota, well knowing he would plunder me, and considered every article taken by him was so much lost to the Sultan of Koti, who naturally would expect the people to reserve me for his own particular plucking. When the fact was known of a European having arrived in the Pergotten River, this amiable prince and friend of Europeans, impatient to seize his prey, came immediately to the point from his country house and sending for the Nakata of the proa, ordered him to land me and all my goods instantly. An invitation now came for me to go on shore and amuse myself with shooting, and look at some rare birds of beautiful plumage which the Rajah would give me if I would accept of them, but knowing what were his intentions, and being well aware that I should be supported by all the Bugis's proas from Koti, I feigned sickness and requested that the birds might be sent on board. Upon this, Agibota, who could no longer restrain himself, sent off two boats of armed men who robbed me of many articles and would certainly have forced me on shore or murdered me in the proa had not a signal been made to the Bugis's Nakadas, who immediately came with their people and with spears and krisses drove the Raja's people overboard. The Nakadas, nine in number, now went on shore when a scene of contention took place, showing clearly the character of this chief. The Bugis from Koti explained that with regard to me it was necessary to be particularly circumspect, as I was not only well known in Singapore, but the authorities in that settlement knew that I was on board the Sultan's proa, and they themselves were responsible for my safety. To this circumstance alone I owe my life on several occasions, as in the event of anything happening to me, every Nakada was apprehensive of his proa being seized on his return to Singapore. I was therefore more peculiarly cared for by this class of men, and they are powerful. The Raja answered the Nakadas by saying, I might be disposed of as many others had been, and no further notice taken of the circumstance. He himself would write to Singapore that I had been taken by an alligator, or bitten by a snake, whilst out shooting. And as for what property I might have in the proa, he would divide it with the Sultan of Koti. The Bugis, however, refused to listen to to any terms, knowing the Sultan of Kodi would call him to an account for the property, and the authorities of Singapore for my life. Our proa, with others, therefore dropped about four miles down the river, where we took in fresh water. Here we remained six days, every argument being in vain to entice me on shore. At length the Bugis's Nakadas came to the determination to sail without passes, which brought the Raja to terms. The proas returned to the point, and I was given to understand I might go on shore in safety. I did so, and was introduced to the Raja, whom I found under a shed with about one hundred and fifty of his people. They were busy gambling, and had the appearance of what they really are, a ferocious set of banditti. 
Aggie Bota is a good-looking man about forty years of age, of no education whatever. He divides his time between gaming, opium, and cockfighting. That is in the interval of his more serious and profitable employment, piracy and rapine. He asked me to produce what money I had about me. On seeing only ten rupees, he remarked that it was not worth while to win so small a sum, but that if I would fight cocks with him, he would lend me as much money as I wanted, and added it was beneath his dignity to fight under fifty reals a battle. On my saying it was contrary to an Englishman's religion to bet wagers, he dismissed me. Immediately after the two rajas produced their cocks and commenced fighting for one rupee a side. I was now obliged to give the old Baudere five rupees to take some care of me, as whilst walking about the people not only thrust their hands into my pockets, but pulled the buttons from my clothes. Whilst sauntering behind the rajah's campong, I caught sight of a European woman, who on perceiving herself observed instantly ran into one of the houses, no doubt dreading the consequences of being recognized. There are now in the house of Agibota two European women. Up the country there are others, besides several men. The Bugis, inimical to the Rajah, made no secret of the fact. I had heard of it on board the proa, and some person in the bazaar confirmed the statement. On my arrival, strict orders had been given to the inhabitants to put all European articles out of sight. One of my servants going into the bazaar brought me such accounts as induced me to visit it. In one house were the following articles. Four Bibles, one in English, one in Dutch, and two in the Portuguese languages— many articles of wearing apparel, such as jackets and trousers, with the buttons altered to suit the natives, pieces of shirts tagged to other parts of dress, several broken instruments, such as quadrants, spy-glasses, two, binnacles with pieces of ship's sails, bolts, and hoops, a considerable variety of gunners and carpenters' tools, stores, etc. In another shop were two polices of faded lilac color, these were of modern cut and fashionably made. On inquiring how they became possessed of these articles, I was told they were some wrecks of European vessels on which no people were found, whilst others made no scruple of averring that they were formerly the property of people who had died in the country. All the goods in the bazaar belonged to the Rajah and were sold on his account. Large quantities were said to be in his house up the river, but on all hands it was admitted Raga and his followers had by far the largest part of what was taken. A mandur, or head of one of the kampongs, showed me some women's stockings, several of which were marked with the letters S.W., also two chemises, one with the letters S.W., two flannel petticoats, a miniature portrait frame, the picture was in the Raja's house, with many articles of dress of both sexes. In consequence of the strict orders given on the subject, I could see no more. Indeed, there were both difficulty and danger attending these inquiries. I particularly wanted to obtain the miniature picture, and offered the mandor fifty rupees if he could procure it. He laughed at me, and pointing significantly to his kris, drew one hand across my throat, and then across his own, giving me to understand such would be the result to us both, on such an application to the Raja. It is the universal custom of the pirates on this coast to sell the people for slaves immediately on their arrival, the Raja taking for himself a few of the most useful and receiving a percentage upon the purchase money of the remainder, with a moiety of the vessel and every article on board. European vessels are taken up the river where they are immediately broken up. The situation of European prisoners is indeed dreadful in a climate like this, where even the labor of natives is intolerable. They are compelled to bear all the drudgery and allowed a bare sufficiency of rice and salt to eat. It is utterly impossible for Europeans who have seen these pirates at such places as Singapore and Batavia to form any conception of their true character. There they are under immediate control, and every part of their behavior is a tissue of falsehood and deception. They constantly carry about with them a smooth tongue, cringing demeanor, a complying disposition which always asserts and never contradicts, a countenance which appears to anticipate the very wish of the Europeans, and which so generally imposes upon his understanding that he at once concludes them to be the best and gentlest of human beings. But let the European meet them in any of their own campongs, and a very different character they will appear. The character and treacherous proceeding 
narrated above and the manner of cutting off vessels and butchering their crews apply equally to all the pirates of the east india islands by which many hundred european and american vessels have been surprised and their crews butchered on the seventh of february eighteen thirty one the ship friendship captain endicott of salem massachusetts was captured by the malays while lying at kuala batu on the coast of sumatra in the forenoon of the fatal day captain endicott mr barry second mate and four of the crew it seems went on shore as usual for the purpose of weighing pepper expecting to obtain that day two boat-loads which had been promised them by the malays after the first boat was loaded they observed that she delayed some time in passing down the river and her crew being composed of malays was supposed by the officers to be stealing pepper from her and secreting it in the bushes in consequence of this conjecture two men were sent off to watch them who on approaching the boat saw five or six malays leap from the jungle and hurry on board of her the former however supposed them to be the boat's crew as they had seen an equal number quit her previous to their own approach in this they were mistaken as will subsequently appear at this time a brig hove in sight and was seen standing towards susu another pepper port distant about five miles captain endicott on going to the beach to ascertain whether the brig had hoisted any colors discovered that the boat with pepper had approached within a few yards of the friendship manned with an unusual number of natives it appears that when the pepper boats came alongside of the friendship as but few of the hands could work at a time numbers of the malays came on board and on being questioned by mr knight the first officer who was in the gangway taking an account of the pepper as to their business their reply was that they had come to see the vessel mr knight ordered them into their boat again and some of them obeyed but only to return immediately to assist in the work of death which was now commenced by attacking mr knight and the rest of the crew on board the crew of the vessel being so scattered it was impossible to concentrate their force so as to make a successful resistance some fell on the forecastle one in the gangway and mr knight fell upon the quarter-deck severely wounded by a stab in the back while in the act of snatching from the bulwarks a boarding pike with which to defend himself the two men who were taking the pepper on a stage having vainly attempted to get on board to the assistance of their comrades were compelled to leap into the sea one of them charles converse of salem being severely wounded succeeded in swimming to the bobstays to which he clung until taken on board by the natives and from some cause he was not afterwards molested his companion john davis being unable to swim drifted with the tide near the boat tackle or davit falls the blocks being overhauled down near the water one of these he laid hold of which the malays perceiving dropped their boat astern and dispatched him the cook sprang into a canoe alongside and in attempting to push off she was capsized and being unable to swim he got on the bottom and paddled ashore with his hands where he was made prisoner gregory an italian sought shelter in the foretop gallant cross trees where he was fired at several times by the malays with the muskets of the friendship which were always kept loaded and ready for use while on the coast three of the crew leaped into the sea and swam to a point of land near a mile distant to the northward of the town and unperceived by the malays on shore pursued their course to the northward towards cape felix intending to go to the port of annalabu about forty-five miles distant having walked all night they found themselves on the following morning near the promontory and still twenty-five miles distant from annalabu when mr endicott mr barry and the four seamen arrived at the beach they saw the crew jumping into the sea the truth now with all its horrors flashed upon his mind that the vessel was attacked and in an instant they jumped on board the boat and pushed off at the same time a friendly rajah named poe adam sprang into the boat he was the proprietor of a port and considerable property at a place called pulokio but three miles distant from the mouth of the river kuala batu more business had been done by the rajah during the eight years past than by any other on the pepper coast he had uniformly professed himself friendly to the americans and he has generally received the character of their being honest 
Speaking a little English as he sprang into the boat, he exclaimed, Captain, you got trouble. Malay kill you. He kill Po Adam, too. Crowds of Malays assembled on both sides of the river, brandishing their weapons in a menacing manner, while a ferry boat, manned with eight or ten of the natives, armed with spears and krises, pushed off to prevent the officers regaining their ship. The latter exhibited no fear and flourished the cutlass of Poe Adam in a menacing manner from the bows of the boat. It so intimidated the Malays that they fled to the shore, leaving a free passage to the ship, but as they got near her they found that the Malays had got entire possession of her. Some of them were promenading the deck, others were making signals of success to the people on shore, while with the exception of one man aloft not an individual of the crew could be seen. Three Malay boats with about fifty men now issued from the river in the direction of the ship, while the captain and his men, concluding that their only hope of recovering their vessel was to obtain assistance from some other ships, directed their course towards Muchi, where they knew that several American vessels were lying at anchor. Three American captains, upon hearing the misfortunes of their countrymen, weighed anchor immediately for Kuala Batu, determined, if possible, to recover the ship. By four o'clock on the same day they gained an anchorage off that place. The Malays, in the meantime, had removed on shore every movable article belonging to the ship, including specie, beside several cases of opium, amounting in all to upwards of thirty thousand dollars. This was done on the night of the ninth, and on the morning of the tenth they contrived to heave in the chain cable and get the anchor up to the bows, and the ship was drifting finely towards the beach when the cable, not being stopped abaft the bits, began suddenly to run out with great velocity. But a bite having by accident been thrown forward of the windlass, a riding turn was the consequence, and the anchor in its descent was suddenly checked about fifteen fathoms from the house. A squall soon after coming on, the vessel drifted obliquely towards the shore, and grounded upon a coral reef near half a mile to the southward of the town. The next day, having obtained a convenient anchorage, a message was sent by a friendly Malay who came on board at Susu, demanding the restoration of the ship. The Rajah replied that he would not give her up, but that they were welcome to take her if they could. A fire was now opened upon the friendship by the vessels. Her decks were crowded with Malays who promptly returned the fire, as did also the forts on shore. This mode of warfare appeared undecisive, and it was determined to decide the contest by a close action. A number of boats being manned and armed with about thirty officers and men, a movement was made to carry the ship by boarding. The Malays did not wait the approach of this determined attack, but all deserted the vessel to her lawful owners when she was taken possession of and warped out into deep water. The appearance of the ship at the time she was boarded beggars all description. Every part of her bore ample testimony to the scene of violence and destruction with which she had been visited. The objects of the voyage were abandoned, and the friendship returned to the United States. The public were unanimous in calling for a redress of the unparalleled outrage on the lives and property of citizens of the United States. The government immediately adopted measures to punish so outrageous an act of piracy by dispatching the frigate Potomac, Commodore Downs' commander. The Potomac sailed from New York the 24th of August, 1831. After touching at Rio Janeiro and the Cape of Good Hope, she anchored off Kuala Batu in February 1832, disguised as a Danish ship, and came to in merchantman style, a few men being sent aloft, dressed in red and blue flannel shirts, and one sail being clued up and furled at a time. A reconnoitering party were sent on shore disguised as pepper dealers, but they returned without being able to ascertain the situations of the forts. The ship now presented a busy scene. It was determined to commence an attack upon the town the next morning, and every necessary preparation was accordingly made. Muskets were cleaned, cartridge boxes buckled on, cutlasses examined and put in order, etc. At twelve o'clock at night all hands were called. Those assigned to take part in the expedition were mustered, when Lieutenant Shubrick, the commander of the detachment, gave them special orders. When they entered the boats and proceeded to the shore, where they effected a landing near the dawn of day, amid a heavy surf about a mile and a half to the north of the town, 
undiscovered by the enemy, and without any serious accident having befallen them, though several of the party were thoroughly drenched by the beating of the surf, and some of their ammunition was injured. The troops then formed and took up their line of march against the enemy, over a beach of deep and heavy sand. They had not proceeded far before they were discovered by a native at a distance, who ran at full speed to give the alarm. A rapid march soon brought them up with the first fort when a division of men under the command of Lieutenant Hoff was detached from the main body and ordered to surround it. The first fort was found difficult of access, in consequence of a deep hedge of thorn bushes and brambles with which it was environed. The assault was commenced by the pioneers with their crows and axes, breaking down the gates and forcing a passage. This was attended with some difficulty and gave the enemy time for preparation. They raised their war whoop and resisted most manfully, fighting with spears, sabers, and muskets. They had also a few brass pieces in the fort, but they managed them with so little skill as to produce no effect, for the balls uniformly whizzed over the heads of our men. The resistance of the melees was in vain, the fort was stormed and soon carried not, however, till almost every individual in it was slain. Po Mahomet, a chief of much distinction, and who was one of the principal persons concerned in the outrage on the friendship, was here slain. The mother of Chedula, another Raja, was also slain here. Another woman fell at this port, but her rank was not ascertained. She fought with the spirit of a desperado. A seaman had just scaled one of the ramparts when he was severely wounded by a blow received from a weapon in her hands, but her life paid the forfeit of her daring, for she was immediately transfixed by a bayonet in the hands of the person whom she had so severely injured. His head was wounded by a javelin, his thumb nearly cut off by a saber, and a ball was shot through his hat. Lieutenants Edson and Ferret proceeded to the rear of the town and made a bold attack upon that fort which, after a spirited resistance on the part of the Malays, surrendered. Both officers and marines here narrowly escaped with their lives. One of the natives in the fort had trained his piece in such a manner as to rake their whole body when he was shot down by a marine while in the very act of applying a match to it. The cannon was afterwards found to have been filled with bullets. This fort, like the former, was environed with thick jungle and great difficulty had been experienced in entering it. The engagement had now become general, and the alarm universal. Men, women, and children were seen flying in every direction, carrying the few articles they were able to seize in the moments of peril, and some of the men were cut down in the flight. Several of the enemy's proas, filled with people, were severely raked by a brisk fire from the six-pounder as they were sailing up the river to the south of the town, and numbers of the natives were killed. The third and most formidable fort was now attacked, and it proved the most formidable, and the cooperation of the several divisions was required for its reduction, but so spirited was the fire poured into it that it was soon obliged to yield, and the next moment the American colors were seen triumphantly waving over its battlements. The greater part of the town was reduced to ashes, the bazaar, the principal place of merchandise, and most of the private dwellings were consumed by fire. The triumph had now been completed over the Malays. Ample satisfaction had been taken for their outrages committed upon our own countrymen, and the bugle sounded the return of the ship's forces, and the embarkation was soon after effected. The action had continued about two hours and a half, and was gallantly sustained both by officers and men from its commencement to its close. The loss on the part of the Malays was near a hundred killed, while of the Americans only two lost their lives. Among the spoils were a Chinese gong, a Koran taken at Mohammed's fort, and several pieces of rich gold cloth. Many of the men came off richly laden with spoils which they had taken from the enemy, such as Raja's scarfs, gold and silver tunam boxes, chains, earrings and finger rings, anklets and bracelets, and a variety of shawls, chrises richly hilted and with gold scabbards, and a variety of other ornaments money to a considerable amount was brought off. That nothing should be left undone to have an indelible impression on the minds of these people of the power of the United States to inflict punishment for aggressions committed on her commerce in seas however distant, 
the ship was got under way the following morning and brought to with a spring on her cable within less than a mile of the shore when the larboard side was brought to bear nearly upon the site of the town the object of the commodore in this movement was not to open an indiscriminate or destructive fire upon the town and inhabitants of kuala batu but to show them the irresistible power of thirty-two pound shot and to reduce the fort of tuca de lama which could not be reached on account of the jungle and stream of water on the morning before and from which a fire had been opened and continued during the embarkation of the troops on their return to the ship the fort was very soon deserted while the shot was cutting it to pieces and tearing up whole cocoa trees by the roots in the afternoon a boat came off from the shore bearing a flag of truce to the commodore beseeching him in all the practice forms of submission of the east that he would grant them peace and cease to fire his big guns hostilities now ceased and the commodore informed them that the objects of his government in sending him to their shores had now been consummated in the punishment of the guilty who had committed their piracies on the friendship thus ended the intercourse with kuala batu the potomac proceeded from this place to china and from thence to the pacific ocean after looking to the interests of the american commerce in those parts she arrived at boston in eighteen thirty four after a three years absence end of chapter thirteen the pirate's own book by charles elms chapter fourteen the adventures of captain condent captain condent was a plymouth born man but we are as yet ignorant of the motives and time of his first turning pirate he was one of those who thought fit to retire from providence on governor rogers arrival at that island in a sloop belonging to mr simpson of new york a Jew merchant, of which sloop he was then quartermaster. Soon after they left the island, an accident happened on board, which put the whole crew into consternation. They had among them an Indian man, whom some of them had beaten. In revenge he got most of the arms forward into the hold, and designed to blow up the sloop, upon which some advised scuttling the deck and throwing grenade shells down, but Condent said that was too tedious and dangerous, since the fellow might fire through the deck and kill several of them. He, therefore, taking a pistol in one hand, and his cutlass in the other, leaped into the hold. The Indian discharged a piece at him, which broke his arm, but, however, he ran up and shot the Indian. When he was dead, the crew hacked him to pieces, and the gunner, ripping up his belly and tearing out his heart, broiled and ate it. After this they took a merchantman called the Duke of York, and some disputes arising among the pirates, the captain, and one half of the company, went on board the prize— the other half, who continued in the sloop, chose Condent captain. He shaped his course for the Cape de Verde Islands, and in his way took a merchant ship from Madeira, laden with wine and bound for the West Indies, which he plundered and let go. Then coming to the Isle of May, one of the said islands, he took the whole salt fleet, consisting of about twenty sail. Wanting a boom, he took out the mainmast of one of these ships to supply the want. Here he took upon himself the administration of justice, Inquiring into the manner of the commander's behavior to their men, and those against whom the complaint was made, he whipped and pickled. He took what provision and other necessaries he wanted, and having augmented his company by volunteers and forced men, he left the ships and sailed to St. Jago, where he took a Dutch ship, which had formerly been a privateer. This proved also an easy prize, for he fired but one broadside, and clapping her on board, carried her without resistance, for the captain and several men were killed, and some wounded by his great shot. The ship proving for his purpose, he gave her the name of the Flying Dragon, went on board with his crew, and made a present of his sloop to a mate of an English prize, whom he had forced with him. From hence he stood away from the coast of Brazil, and in his cruise took several Portuguese ships, which he plundered and let go. After these he fell in with a right galley, Captain John Spelt, commander, hired by the South Sea Company, to go to the coast of Angola for slaves, and thence to Buenos Aires. This ship he detained a considerable time, and the captain being his townsman, treated him very civilly. A few days after he took spelt, he made prize of a Portuguese, laden with bale goods and stores. He rigged the right galley anew, and put on board of her some of the goods. Soon after he had discharged the Portuguese, he met with a Dutch East Indiaman of twenty-eight guns, whose captain was killed the first broadside, and took her with little resistance, for he had hoisted the pirate's colors on board Spelt's ship. He now, with three sail, steered for the islands of Ferdinando, where he hove down and cleaned the flying dragon. 
Having careened, he put eleven Dutchmen on board Captain Spelt, to make amends for the hands he had forced from him, and sent him away, making him a present of the goods he had taken from the Portuguese ship. When he sailed himself, he ordered the Dutch to stay at Ferdinando twenty-four hours after his departure, threatening, if he did not comply, to sink his ship, if he fell a second time into his hands, and to put all the company to the sword. He then stood for the coast of Brazil, where he met a Portuguese man-of-war of seventy guns, which he came up with. The Portuguese hailed him, and he answered, From London, bound to Buenos Aires. The Portuguese manned his shrouds and cheered him, when Condent fired a broadside, and a smart engagement ensued for the space of three glasses, but Condent, finding himself overmatched, made the best of his way, and being the best sailor, got off. A few days after, he took a vessel of the same nation, who gave an account that he had killed above forty men in the Guarda del Costa, beside a number wounded. He kept along the coast to the southward, and took a French ship of eighteen guns, laden with wine and brandy, bound for the South Sea, which he carried with him into the river of Platte. He sent some of his men ashore to kill some wild cattle, but they were taken by the crew of a Spanish man-of-war. On their examination before the captain, they said they were two guinea ships, with slaves belonging to the South Sea Company, and on this story were allowed to return to their boats. Here five of his forced men ran away with his canoe. He plundered the French ship, cut her adrift, and she was stranded. He proceeded along the Brazil coast, and hearing a pirate ship was lost upon it, and the pirates imprisoned, he used all the Portuguese who fell into his hands, who were many, very barbarously, cutting off their ears and noses. And as his master was a papist, when they took a priest, they made him say mass at the mainmast, and would afterwards get on his back and ride him about the decks, or else load and drive him like a beast. He from this went to the Guinea coast, and took Captain Hill in the Indian Queen. In Luengo Bay he saw two ships at anchor, one a Dutchman of forty-four guns, the other an English ship called the Fame, Captain Bowen commander. They both cut and ran ashore. The Fame was lost, but the Dutch ship the pirate got off and took with him. When he was at sea again he discharged Captain Hill, and stood away for the East Indies. Near the Cape he took an Ostend East Indiaman, of which Mr. Nash, a noted merchant of London, was supercargo. Soon after, he took a Dutch East Indiaman, discharged the Ostender, and made for Madagascar. At the Isle of St. Mary, he met with some of Captain Halsey's crew, whom he took on board with other stragglers, and shaped his course for the East Indies, and in the way, at the Isle of Johanna, took, in company with two other pirates he met at St. Mary's, the Cassandra East Indiaman, commanded by Captain James McRae. He continued his course for the East Indies, where he made a very great booty, and returning, touched at the island of Mascarenes, where he met with a Portuguese ship of seventy guns, with the Viceroy of Goa on board. This ship he made prize of, and hearing she had money on board, they would allow of no ransom, but carried her to the coast of Zanguebar, where was a Dutch fortification, which they took and plundered, raised the fort, and carried off several men voluntarily. From hence they stood for St. Mary's, where they shared their booty, broke up their company, and settled among the natives. Here a snow came from Bristol, which they obliged to carry a petition to the governor of Mascarenas for a pardon, though they paid the master very generously. The governor returned answer he would take them into protection if they would destroy their ships, which they agreed to, and accordingly sunk the flying dragon and company. Condent and some others went to Mascarenas, where Condent married the governor's sister-in-law, and remained some time, but, as I have been credibly informed, he has since come to France, settled at St. Malo's, and drives a considerable trade as a merchant. End of chapter 14The Pirate's Own Book by Charles Elms Chapter 15 The Life of Captain Edward Lowe This ferocious villain was born in Westminster, and received an education similar to that of the common people in England. He was by nature a pirate, for even when very young he raised contributions among the boys of Westminster, and if they declined compliance, a battle was the result. When he advanced a step farther in life, he began to exert his ingenuity at low games, and cheating all in his power, and those who pretended to maintain their own right he was ready to call to the field of combat. He went to sea in company with his brother, and continued with him for three or four years. Going over to America, 
he wrought in a rigging house at Boston for some time. He then came home to see his mother in England, returned to Boston, and continued for some years longer at the same business. But being of a quarrelsome temper, he differed with his master, and went on board a sloop bound for the Bay of Honduras. While there, he had the command of a boat employed in bringing logwood to the ship. In that boat there were twelve men, well armed, to be prepared for the Spaniards, from whom the wood was taken by force. It happened one day that the boat came to the ship just a little before dinner was ready, and Lowe desired that they might dine before they returned. The captain, however, ordered them a bottle of rum, and requested them to take another trip, as no time was to be lost. The crew were enraged, particularly Lowe, who took up a loaded musket and fired at the captain. But missing him, another man was shot, and they ran off with the boat. The next day they took a small vessel, went on board her, hoisted a black flag, and declared war with the whole world. In their rovings, Lowe met with Lowther, who proposed that he should join him and thus promote their mutual advantage. Having captured a brigantine, Lowe, with forty more, went on board her, and leaving Lowther, they went to seek their own fortune. Their first adventure was the capture of a vessel belonging to Amboy, out of which they took the provisions and allowed her to proceed. On the same day they took a sloop, plundered her, and permitted her to depart. The sloop went into Black Island, and sent intelligence to the governor that Lowe was on the coast. Two small vessels were immediately fitted out, but before their arrival Lowe was beyond their reach. After this narrow escape, Lowe went into port to procure water and fresh provisions, and then renewed his search of plunder. He next sailed into the harbour of Port Rosemary, where were thirteen ships, but none of them of any great strength. Lowe hoisted the black flag, assuring them that if they made any resistance they should have no quarter, and manning their boat, the pirates took possession of every one of them, which they plundered and converted to their own use. They then put on board a schooner ten guns and fifty men, named her the Fancy, and Lowe himself went on board of her, while Charles Harris was constituted captain of the brigantine. They also constrained a few of the men to join them and sign their articles. After an unsuccessful pursuit of two sloops from Boston, they steered for the Leeward Islands, but in their way were overtaken by a terrible hurricane. The search for plunder gave place to the most vigorous exertion to save themselves. On board the brigantine all hands were at work, both day and night. They were under the necessity of throwing overboard six of her guns and all the weighty provisions. In the storm the two vessels were separated, and it was some time before they again saw each other. After the storm, Lowe went into a small island west of the Caribbees, refitted his vessels, and got provision for them in exchange of goods. As soon as the brigantine was ready for sea, they went on a cruise until the fancy should be prepared, and during that cruise met with a vessel which had lost all her masts in the storm, which they plundered of goods to the value of one thousand pounds and returned to the island. When the fancy was ready to sail, a council was held what course they should next steer. They followed the advice of the captain, who thought it not safe to cruise any longer to the leeward, lest they should fall in with any of the men of war that cruised upon that coast, so they sailed for the Azores. The good fortune of Lowe was now singular. In his way thither he captured a French ship of thirty-four guns, and carried her along with him. Then entering St. Michael's Roads, he captured seven sail, threatening with instant death all who dared to oppose him. Thus, by inspiring terror, without firing a single gun, he became master of all that property. Being in want of water and fresh provisions, Lowe sent to the governor demanding a supply, upon condition of releasing the ships he had taken, otherwise he would commit them to the flames. The request was instantly complied with, and six of the vessels were restored. But, a French vessel being among them, they emptied her of guns and all her men except the cook, who, they said, being a greasy fellow, would fry well. They accordingly bound the unfortunate man to the mast, and set the ship on fire. The next who fell in their way was Captain Carter, in the right galley, who, because he showed some inclination to defend himself, was cut and mangled in a barbarous manner. There were also two Portuguese friars, whom they tied to the foremast, and several times let them down before they were dead, merely to gratify their own ferocious dispositions. 
Meanwhile, another Portuguese, beholding this cruel scene, expressed some sorrow in his countenance, upon which one of the wretches said he did not like his looks, and so giving him a stroke across the body with his cutlass, he fell upon the spot. Another of the miscreants, aiming a blow at a prisoner, missed his aim, and struck low upon the under jaw. The surgeon was called, and stitched up the wound, but Lowe finding fault with the operation, the surgeon gave him a blow which broke all the stitches, and left him to sew them himself. After he had plundered this vessel, some of them were for burning her, as they had done the Frenchmen, but instead of that, they cut her cables, rigging, and sails to pieces, and sent her adrift to the mercy of the waves. They next sailed for the island of Madeira, and took up a fishing boat with two old men and a boy. They detained one of them, and sent the other on shore with a flag of truce, requesting the governor to send them a boat of water, else they would hang the other man at the yard-arm. The water was sent, and the man dismissed. They next sailed for the Canary Islands, and there took several vessels, and being informed that two small galleys were daily expected, the sloop was manned and sent in quest of them. They, however, missing their prey, and being great in want of provision, went into St. Michael's in the character of traders, and being discovered, were apprehended, and the whole crew conducted to the castle, and treated according to their merits. Meanwhile, Lowe's ship was overset upon the careen and lost, so that, having only the fancy schooner remaining, they all, to the number of a hundred, went on board her, and set sail in search of new spoils. They soon met a rich Portuguese vessel, and after some resistance, captured her. Lowe tortured the men to constrain them to inform him where they had hid her treasures. He accordingly discovered that, during the chase, the captain had hung a bag with eleven thousand moedores out of the cabin window, and that, when they were taken, he had cut the rope and allowed it to fall into the sea. Upon this intelligence, Low raved and stormed like a fury, ordered the captain's lips to be cut off and broiled before his eyes, then murdered him and all his crew. After this bloody action, the miscreants steered northward, and in their course seized several vessels, one of which they burned, and plundering the rest allowed them to proceed. Having cleaned in one of the islands, they then sailed for the Bay of Honduras. They met a Spaniard coming out of the bay, which had captured five Englishmen and a pink, plundered them, and brought away the master's prisoners. Low hoisted Spanish colors, but, when he came near, hung out the black flag, and the Spaniard was seized without resistance. Upon finding the masters of the English vessels in the hold, and seeing English goods on board, a consultation was held, when it was determined to put all the Spaniards to the sword. This was scarcely resolved upon, when they commenced with every species of weapons, to massacre every man, and some flying from their merciless hands into the waves, a canoe was sent in pursuit of those who endeavoured to swim on shore. They next plundered the Spanish vessel, restored the English masters to their respective vessels, and set the Spaniard on fire. Lowe's next cruise was between the Leeward Islands and the mainland, where, in a continued course of prosperity, he successively captured no less than nineteen ships of different sizes, and in general treated their crews with a barbarity unequalled even among pirates. But it happened that the Greyhound, of twenty guns and one hundred and twenty men, was cruising upon that coast. Informed of the mischief these miscreants had done, the Greyhound went in search of them. Supposing they had discovered a prize, Lowe and his crew pursued them, and the Greyhound, allowing them to run after her until all things were ready to engage, turned upon the two sloops. One of these sloops was called the Fancy, and commanded by Lowe himself, and the other the Ranger, commanded by Harris. Both hoisted their piratical colours and fired each a gun. When the Greyhound came within musket shot, she hauled up her mainsail and clapped close upon a wind to keep the pirates from running to leeward, and then engaged. But when the rogues found whom they had to deal with, they edged away under the man-of-war's stern, and the greyhound standing after them, they made a running fight for about two hours. But little wind happening, the sloops gained from her, by the help of their oars, upon which the greyhound left off firing, turned all hands to her own oars, and at three in the afternoon came up with them. The pirates hauled upon a wind to receive the man-of-war, and the fight was immediately renewed, with a brisk fire on both sides, till the ranger's mainyard was shot down. Under these circumstances, Lowe abandoned her to the enemy, and fled. The conduct of Lowe was surprising in this adventure, because his reputed courage and boldness had hitherto so possessed the minds of all people that he became a terror even to his own men. 
but his behavior throughout this whole action showed him to be a base, cowardly villain, for had Lowe's sloop fought half so briskly as Harris's had done, as they were under a solemn oath to do, the man of war, in the opinion of some present, could never have hurt them. Nothing, however, could lessen the fury or reform the manners of that obdurate crew. Their narrow escape had no good effect upon them, and with redoubled violence they renewed their depredations and cruelties. The next vessel they captured was eighty miles from land. They used the master with the most wanton cruelty, then shot him dead, and forced the crew into the boat with a compass, a little water, and a few biscuits, and left them to the mercy of the waves. They, however, beyond all expectation, got safe to shore. Lowe proceeded in his villainous career with two fatal success. Unsatisfied with satiating their avarice and walking the common path of wickedness, those inhuman wretches, like to Satan himself, made mischief their sport, cruelty their delight, and the ruin and murder of their fellow men their constant employment. Of all the piratical crews belonging to the English nation, none ever equaled Lowe in barbarity. Their mirth and their anger had the same effect. They murdered a man from good humor as well as from anger and passion. Their ferocious disposition seemed only to delight in cries, groans, and lamentations. One day, Lowe, having captured Captain Graves, a Virginia man, took a bowl of punch in his hand and said, "'Captain, here's half this to you.' The poor gentleman was too much touched with his misfortunes to be in a humor for drinking. He therefore modestly excused himself. Upon this, Lowe cocked and presented a pistol in the one hand, and his bowl in the other, saying, "'Either take the one or the other.'" Lowe next captured a vessel called the Christmas mounted her with thirty-four guns, went on board her himself, assumed the title of admiral, and hoisted the black flag. His next prize was a brigantine, half manned with Portuguese and half with English. The former he hanged, and the latter he thrust into their boat and dismissed, while he set fire to the vessel. The success of Lowe was unequalled, as well as his cruelty, and during a long period he continued to pursue his wicked course with impunity. All wickedness comes to an end and Lowe's crew at last rose against him, and he was thrown into a boat without provisions and abandoned to his fate. This was because Lowe murdered the quartermaster while he lay asleep. Not long after he was cast adrift, a French vessel happened along and took him into Martinico, and after a quick trial by the authorities, he received short shift on a gallows erected for his benefit. End of chapter 15 Life and Adventures of Captain Edward England This adventure was mate of a sloop that sailed from Jamaica, and was taken by Captain Winter, a pirate, just before the settlement of the pirates at Providence Island. After the pirates had surrendered to His Majesty's pardon, and Providence Island was peopled by the English government, Captain England sailed to Africa. There he took several vessels, particularly the Cadigan, from Bristol, commanded by one Skinner. When the latter struck to the pirate, he was ordered to come on board in his boat. The person upon whom he first cast his eye proved to be his old boatswain, who stared him in the face and accosted him in the following manner. Ah, Captain Skinner, is it you, the only person I wished to see? I am much in your debt, and I shall pay you in your own coin. The poor man trembled in every joint, and dreaded the event, as he well might. It happened that Skinner and his old boatswain, with some of his men, had quarrelled, so that he thought fit to remove them on board a man of war, while he refused to pay them their wages. Not long after, they found means to leave the man of war, and went on board a small ship in the West Indies. They were taken by a pirate, and brought to Providence, and from thence sailed as pirates with Captain England. Thus, accidentally meeting their old captain, they severely revenged the treatment they had received. After the rough salutation which has been related, the boatswain called to his comrades, laid hold of Skinner, tied him fast to the windlass, and pelted him with glass bottles until they cut him in a shocking manner, then whipped him about the deck until they were quite fatigued, remaining deaf to all his prayers and entreaties, and at last, in an insulting tone, observed that as he had been a good master to his men, he should have an easy death, and upon this shot him through the head. Having taken such things out of the ship as they stood most in need of, she was given to Captain Davis in order to try his fortune with a few hands. Captain England, some time after, took a ship called the Pearl, for which he exchanged his own sloop, fitted her up for piratical service, and called her the Royal James. In that vessel he was very fortunate, 
and took several ships of different sizes and different nations. In the spring of 1719, the pirates returned to Africa, and beginning at the river Gambia, sailed down the coast to Cape Corso, and captured several vessels. Some of them they pillaged and allowed to proceed, some they fitted out for the pirate service, and others they burned. Leaving our pirate upon this coast, the Revenge and the Flying King, two other pirate vessels, sailed for the West Indies, where they took several prizes, and then cleared and sailed for Brazil. There they captured some Portuguese vessels, but a large Portuguese man of war coming up to them proved an unwelcome guest. The Revenge escaped, but was soon lost upon that coast. The Flying King in despair ran ashore. There were then seventy on board, twelve of whom were slain, and the remainder taken prisoners. The Portuguese hanged thirty-eight of them. Captain England, whilst cruising upon that coast, took the Peterborough of Bristol and the Victory. The former they detained, the latter they plundered and dismissed. In the course of his voyage, England met with two ships, but these taking shelter under Cape Corsal Castle, he unsuccessfully attempted to set them on fire. He next sailed down to Widder Road, where Captain Labouche had been before England, and left him no spoil. He now went into the harbor, cleaned his own ship, and fitted the Peterborough, which he called the Victory. During several weeks the pirates remained in this quarter, indulging in every species of riot and debauchery until the natives, exasperated with their conduct, came to an open rupture, when several of the negroes were slain, and one of their towns set on fire by the pirates. Leaving that port, the pirates, when at sea, determined by vote to sail for the East Indies, and arrived at Madagascar. After watering and taking in some provisions, they sailed for the coast of Malabar. This place was situated in the Mogul Empire, and is one of its most beautiful and fertile districts. It extends from the coast of Canora to Cape Comorin. The original natives are Negroes, but a mingled race of Mahometans, who are generally merchants, have been introduced in modern times. Having sailed almost round the one half of the globe, literally seeking whom they might devour, our pirates arrived in this hitherto untried and prolific field for their operations. Not long after their settlement at Madagascar, they took a cruise, in which they captured two Indian vessels and a Dutchman. They exchanged the latter for one of their own, and directed their course again to Madagascar. Several of their hands were sent on shore with tents and ammunition, to kill such beasts and venison as the island afforded. They also formed the resolution to go in search of Avery's crew, which they knew had settled upon the island, but as their residence was upon the other side of the island, the loss of time and labor was the only fruit of their search. They tarried here but a very short time, then steered their course to Joanna, and coming out of that harbor, fell in with two English vessels and an Ostend ship, all Indiamen, which, after a most desperate action, they captured. The particulars of this extraordinary action are related in the following letter from Captain Macra. Bombay, November 16th, 1720. We arrived on the 25th of July last, in company with the Greenwich at Joanna, and I not far from Madagascar, Putting in there to refresh our men, we found fourteen pirates who came in their canoes from the Mayota, where the pirate ship to which they belonged, viz. the Indian Queen, two hundred and fifty tons, twenty-eight guns, and ninety men, commanded by Captain Oliver de la Bouche, bound from the Guinea coast to the East Indies, had been bulged and lost. They said they left the captain and forty of their men building a new vessel, to proceed on their wicked designs. Captain Kirby and I, concluding that it might be of great service to the East India Company to destroy such a nest of rogues, were ready to sail for that purpose on the 17th of August, about eight o'clock in the morning, when we discovered two pirates standing into the Bay Joanna, one of thirty-four, and the other of thirty-six guns. I immediately went on board the Greenwich, where they seemed very diligent in preparation for an engagement, and I left Captain Kirby with mutual promises of standing by each other. I then unmoored, got under sail, and brought two boats ahead to row me close to the Greenwich, but he, being open to a valley and a breeze, made the best of his way from me, which an Ostender in our company, of twenty-two guns, seeing, did the same, though the captain had promised heartily to engage with us, and I believe would have been as good as his word if Captain Kirby had kept his. About half an hour after twelve, I called several times to the Greenwich to bear down to our assistance, and fired a shot at him, but to no purpose for though we did not doubt but he would join us, because, when he got about a league from us he brought his ship to and looked on, yet both he and the Ostender basely deser deserted us, and left us engaged with barbarous and inhuman enemies, with their black and bloody flags hanging over us, without the least appearance of ever escaping, but to be cut to pieces. But God in his good providence determined otherwise, 
for, notwithstanding their superiority, we engaged them both about three hours, during which time the biggest of them received some shot betwixt wind and water, which made her keep off a little to stop her leaks. The other endeavored all she could to board us by rowing with her oars, being within half a ship's length of us about an hour. But by good fortune we shot all her oars to pieces, which prevented them, and by consequence saved our lives. About four o'clock most of the officers and men posted on the quarter-deck being killed and wounded, the largest ship making up to us with diligence, being still within a cable's length of us, often giving us a broadside, there being now no hopes of Captain Kirby's coming to our assistance, we endeavored to run ashore, and though we drew four feet of water more than the pirate, it pleased God that he stuck fast on a higher ground than, happily, we fell in with, so was disappointed a second time from boarding us. Here we had a more violent engagement than before. All my officers and most of my men behaved with unexpected courage, and, as we had a considerable advantage by having a broadside to his bow, we did him great damage, so that had Captain Kirby come in then, I believe we should have taken both the vessels, for we had one of them sure, but the other pirate, who was still firing at us, seeing the Greenwich did not offer to assist us, supplied his consort with three boats full of fresh men. About five in the evening the Greenwich stood clear away to sea, leaving us struggling hard for life in the very jaws of death, which the other pirate that was afloat seeing got a warp out and was hauling under our stern. By this time many of my men being killed and wounded and no hopes left of us escaping being all murdered by enraged barbarous conquerors, I ordered all that could to get into the longboat under the cover of the smoke of our guns, so that, with what some did in boats and others by swimming, most of us that were able got ashore by seven o'clock. When the pirates came aboard, they cut three of our wounded men to pieces. I, with some of my people, made what haste I could to Kingstown, twenty-five miles from us, where I arrived next day, almost dead with the fatigue and loss of blood, having been sorely wounded in the head by a musket ball. At this town I heard that the pirates had offered ten thousand dollars to the country people to bring me in, which many of them would have accepted, only they knew the king and all his chief people were in my interest. Meanwhile, I caused a report to be spread that I was dead of my wounds, which much abated their fury. About ten days after, being pretty well recovered, and hoping the malice of our enemies was nigh over, I began to consider the dismal condition we were reduced to, being in a place where we had no hopes of getting a passage home, all of us in a manner naked, not having had time to bring with us either a shirt or a pair of shoes, except what we had on. Having obtained leave to go on board the pirates with the promise of safety, several of the chief of them knew me, and some of them had sailed with me, which I found to be of great advantage, because, notwithstanding their promise, some of them would have cut me to pieces, and all that would not enter with them had it not been for their chief captain, Edward England, and some others whom I knew. They talked of their burning one of our ships, which we had so entirely disabled as to be no farther use to them, and to fit the Cassandra in her room, but in the end I managed the affair so well that they made me a present of the said shattered ship, which was Dutch-built, and called the Fancy, her burden was about three hundred tons. I procured also a hundred and twenty-nine bales of the company's cloth, though they would not give me a rag of my own clothes. They sailed the third of September, and I, with jury masts and such old sails as they left me, made a shift to do the like on the eighth, together with forty-three of my ship's crew, including two passengers and twelve soldiers, having no more than five tons of water aboard. After a passage of forty-eight days, I arrived here on the twenty-sixth of October, almost naked and starved, having been reduced to a pint of water a day, and almost in despair of ever seeing land, by reason of the calms we met with between the coast of Arabia and Malabar. We had in all thirteen men killed and twenty-four wounded, and we were told that we destroyed about ninety or a hundred of the pirates. When they left us, they were about three hundred whites and eighty black on both ships. I am persuaded, had our consort the Greenwich done his duty, we had destroyed both of them, and got two hundred thousand pounds for our owners and selves whereas the loss of the Cassandra may justly be imputed to his deserting us. I have delivered all the bales that were given me into the company's warehouse, for which the governor and council have ordered me a reward. Our governor, Mr. Boone, who is extremely kind and civil to me, had ordered me home with the packet, but Captain Harvey, who had a prior promise, being home in with the fleet, goes in my room. The governor had promised me a country voyage to help to make up my losses, and would have me stay and accompany him to England next year. Captain Macra was certainly in imminent danger, in trusting himself and his men on board the pirate ship, and unquestionably nothing but the desperate circumstances in which he was placed could have justified so hazardous a step. The honor and influence of Captain England, however, protected him and his men from the fury of the crew, 
who would willingly have wreaked their vengeance upon them. It is pleasing to discover any instance of generosity or honor among such an abandoned race, who bid defiance to all the laws of honor, and, indeed, are regardless of all laws human and divine. Captain England was so steady to Captain Macra that he informed him it would be with no small difficulty in address that he would be able to preserve him and his men from the fury of the crew, who were greatly enraged at all the resistance which had been made. He likewise acquainted him that his influence and authority among them was giving place to that of Captain Taylor, chiefly because the dispositions of the latter were more savage and brutal. They therefore consulted between them what was the best method to secure the favor of Taylor and keep him in good humor. Macra made the punch to flow in great abundance, and employed every artifice to soothe the mind of that ferocious villain. A single incident was also very favorable to the unfortunate captain. It happened that a pirate, with a prodigious pair of whiskers, a wooden leg, and stuck round with pistols, came blustering and swearing upon the quarter-deck, inquiring, Where is Captain Macra? He naturally supposed that this barbarous-looking fellow would be his executioner, but, as he approached, he took the captain by the hand, swearing that he was an honest fellow, and that he had formerly sailed with him, and would stand by him, and let him see the man that would touch him. This terminated the dispute, and Captain Taylor's disposition was so ameliorated with punch, that he consented that the old pirate ship, and so many bales of cloth, should be given to Macra, and then sank into the arms of intoxication. England now pressed Macra to hasten away, lest the ruffian, upon his becoming sober, should not only retract his word, but give liberty to the crew to cut him and his men to pieces. But the gentler temper of Captain England, and his generosity toward the unfortunate Macra, proved the organ of much calamity to himself. The crew, in general, deeming the kind of usage which Macra had received inconsistent with piratical policy, they circulated a report that he was coming against them with the company's force. The result of these invidious reports was to deprive England of his command, and to excite these cruel villains to put him on shore, with three others, upon the island of Mauritius. If England and his small company had not been destitute of every necessary, they might have made a comfortable subsistence here, as the islands abound with deer, hogs, and other animals. Dissatisfied, however, with their solitary situation, Captain England and his three men exerted their industry and ingenuity, and formed a small boat, with which they sailed to Madagascar, where they subsisted upon the generosity of some more fortunate piratical companions. Captain Taylor detained some of the officers and men belonging to Captain Macra, and having repaired their vessel, sailed for India. The day before they made land, they espied two ships to the eastward, and supposing them to be English, Captain Taylor ordered one of the officers of Macra's ship to communicate to him the private signals between the company's ships, swearing that if he did not do so immediately, he would cut him into pound pieces. But the poor man, being unable to give the information demanded, was under the necessity of enduring their threats. Arrived at the vessels, they found that they were two Moorish ships, laden with horses. The pirates brought the captains and merchants on board, and tortured them in a barbarous manner, to constrain them to tell where they had hid their treasure. They were, however, disappointed, and the next morning they discovered land, and at the same time a fleet on shore plying to windward. In this situation they were at a considerable loss how to dispose of their prizes. To let them go would lead to their discovery, and thus defeat the design of their voyage and it was a distressing matter to sink the men and the horses, though many of them were for adopting that measure. They, however, brought them to anchor, threw all the sails overboard, and cut one of the masts half through. While they lay at anchor, and were employed in taking in water, one of the above-mentioned fleet moved toward them with English colors, and was answered by the pirate with a red ensign, but they did not hail each other. At night, they left the musket ships, and sailed after the fleet. About four next morning, the pirates were in the midst of the fleet, but seeing their vast superiority, were greatly at a loss what method to adopt. The victory had become leaky, and their hands were so few in number, that it only remained for them to deceive, if possible, the English squadron. They were unsuccessful in gaining anything out of that fleet, and had only the wretched satisfaction of burning a single galley. They, however, that day seized a galliot laden with cotton, and made inquiry of the men concerning the fleet. They protested that they had not seen a ship since they left Gogo, and earnestly implored their mercy, but, instead of treating them with lenity, they put them to the rack in order to extort farther confession. The following day, a fresh easterly wind blew hard and rent the galliot's sails. Upon this, the pirates put her company into a boat with nothing but a trysail, no provisions, and only four gallons of water, and, though they were out of sight of land, left them to shift for themselves. It may be proper to inform our readers that one Angria, 
an Indian prince of considerable territory and strength, had proved a troublesome enemy to Europeans, and particularly to the English. Calaba was his principal fort, situated not many leagues from Bombay, and he possessed an island in sight of the port, from whence he molested the company's ships. His art in bribing the ministers of the great Mogul, and the shallowness of the water that prevented large ships of war from approaching, were the principal causes of his safety. The Bombay fleet, consisting of four grabs, the London and the Candwa, and two other ships, with a galliot, having an additional thousand men on board for this enterprise, sailed to attack a fort belonging to Angria upon the Malabar coast. Though their strength was great, yet they were totally unsuccessful in their enterprise. It was this fleet returning home that our pirates discovered upon the present occasion. Upon the sight of the pirates, the commodore of the fleet intimated to Mr. Brown, the general, that as they had no orders to fight, and had gone upon a different purpose, it would be improper for them to engage. Informed of the loss of this favorable opportunity of destroying the robbers, the governor of Bombay was highly enraged, and giving the command of the fleet to Captain Macra, ordered him to pursue and engage them wherever they should be found. The pirates, having barbarously sent away the galliot with her men, they arrived southward, and between Goa and Karwar they heard several guns, so that they came to anchor and sent their boat to reconnoitre, which returned next morning with the intelligence of two grabs lying at anchor in the road. They accordingly weighed, ran toward the bay, and in the morning were discovered by the grabs, who had just time to run under India Diva Castle for protection. This was the more vexatious to the pirates, as they were without water, some of them, therefore, were for making a descent upon the island, but that measure not being generally approved, they sailed toward the south and took a small ship, which had only a Dutchman and two Portuguese on board. They sent one of these on shore to the captain to inform him that, if he would give them some water and fresh provisions, he might have his vessel returned. He replied that, if they would give him possession over the bar, he would comply with their request, but, suspecting the integrity of his design, they sailed for Lacadiva Islands, uttering dreadful imprecations against the captain. Disappointed in finding water at these islands, they sailed to Melinda Island and sent their boats on shore to discover if there was any water, or if there were any inhabitants. They returned with the information that there was an abundance of water, that the houses were only inhabited by women and children, the men having fled at the appearance of the ships. They accordingly hastened to supply themselves with water, used the defenseless women in a brutal manner, destroyed many of their fruit trees, and set some of their houses on fire. While off the island, they lost several of their anchors by the rockiness of the ground, and one day, blowing more violently than usual, they were forced to take to sea, leaving several people in most of the water casks, but when the gale was over, they returned to take in their men and water. Their provisions being nearly exhausted, they resolved to visit the Dutch at Cochin. After sailing three days, they arrived off Telesheri, and took a small vessel belonging to Governor Adams, and brought the master on board, very much intoxicated, who informed them of the expedition of Captain Macra. This intelligence raised their utmost indignation. A villain, said they, to whom we have given a ship in presence to come against us. He ought to be hanged, and since we cannot show our resentment to him, let us hang the dogs his people, who wish him well, and would do the same if they were clear. If it be in my power, said the quartermaster, both masters and officers of ships shall be carried with us for the future, only to plague them. Now, England, we mark him for this. They proceeded to Calicut, and attempting to cut out a ship, were prevented by some guns placed upon the shore. One of Captain Macra's officers was under deck at this time, and was commanded both by the captain and the quartermaster to tend the braces on the booms, in hopes that a shot would take him before they got clear. He was about to have excused himself, but they threatened to shoot him, and when he expostulated and claimed their promise to put him on shore, he received an unmerciful beating from the quartermaster, Captain Taylor, to whom that duty belonged, being lame in his hands. The next day following, they met a Dutch galliot, laden with limestone, bound for Calicut, on board of which they put one Captain Fox, and some of the crew interceding for Macra's officer, Taylor and his party replied, If we let this dog go, who has overheard our designs and resolutions, he will overset all our well-advised resolutions, and particularly the supply we are seeking for at the hands of the Dutch. When they arrived at Cochin, they sent a letter on shore by a fishing boat, entered the road, and anchored each ship saluting the fort with eleven guns, and receiving the same number in return. This was the token of their welcome reception, and at night a large boat was sent, deeply laden with liquors and all kinds of provisions, and in it a servant of John Trumpet, one of their friends, to inform them that it would be necessary for them to run further south, where they would be supplied both with provisions and naval stores. 
They had scarcely anchored at the appointed place when several canoes with white and black inhabitants came on board, and continued without interruption to perform all the good offices in their power during their stay in that place. In particular, John Trumpet brought a large boat of arrack and sixty bales of sugar, as a present from the governor and his daughter, the former receiving in return a table clock, and the other a gold watch, the spoil of Captain Macra's vessel. When their provisions were all on board, Trumpet was rewarded with about six or seven thousand pounds, was saluted with three cheers and eleven guns, and several hands full of silver were thrown into the boat for the men to gather at pleasure. There being little wind that night, they remained at anchor, and in the morning were surprised with the return of Trumpet, bringing another boat equally well stored with provisions, with chests of peace goods and ready-made clothes, and along with him the fiscal of the place. At noon they espied a sail toward the south, and immediately gave chase, but she outsailed them, and sheltered under the fort of Cochin. Informed that they would not be molested in taking her from under the castle, they sailed towards her, but upon the fort firing two guns, they ran off, for fear of more serious altercation, and returning, anchored in their former station. They were too welcome visitants to be permitted to depart, so long as John Trumpet could contrive to detain them. With this view he informed them that in a few days a rich vessel, commanded by the governor of Bombay's brother, was to pass that way. That government is certainly in a wretched state which is under the necessity of trading with pirates in order to enrich itself, nor will such a government hesitate by what means an injury can be repaired, or a fortune gained. Neither can language describe the low and base principles of a government which could employ such a miscreant as John Trumpet in its service. He was a tool in the hands of the government of Cochin, and, as the dog said in the fable, what is done by the master's orders is the master's action, or, as the same sentiment is perhaps better expressed in the legal axiom, qui facet per alium facet per se. While under the direction of Trumpet, some proposed to proceed directly to Madagascar, but others were disposed to wait until they should be provided with a store ship, the majority being of the latter opinion, they steered to the south, and seeing a ship on shore were desirous to get near her, but the wind preventing, they separated, the one sailing northward and the other southward, in hopes of securing her when she should come out, whatever direction she might take. They were now, however, almost entrapped in the snare laid for them. In the morning, to their astonishment and consternation, instead of being called to give chase, five large ships were near, which made a signal for the pirates to bear down. The pirates were in the greatest dread lest it should be Captain Macra, of whose activity and courage they had formerly sufficient proof. The pirate ships, however, joined and fled with all speed from the fleet. In three hours' chase, none of the fleet gained upon them, except one grab. The remainder of the day was calm, and, to their great consolation, the next day this dreaded fleet was entirely out of sight. Their alarm being over, they resolved to spend the Christmas in feasting and mirth in order to drown care and to banish thought. Nor did one day suffice but they continued their reveling for several days, and made so free with their fresh provisions, that in their next cruise they were put upon short allowance, and it was entirely owing to the sugar and other provisions that were in the leaky ship, that they were preserved from absolute starvation. In this condition, they reached the island of Mauritius, refitted the victory, and left that place with the following inscription written upon one of the walls, left this place on the 5th of April, to go to Madagascar for Limos. This they did, lest any visit should be paid to the place during their absence. They, however, did not sail directly from Madagascar, but the island of Mascarius, where they fortunately fell in with the Portuguese of seventy guns, lying at anchor. The greater part of her guns had been thrown overboard, her masts lost, and the whole vessel disabled by a storm. She therefore became an easy prey to the pirates. Conde de Ericera, viceroy of Goa, who went upon the fruitless expedition against Angria the Indian, and several passengers, were on board. Besides other valuable articles in specie, they found in her diamonds to the amount of four millions of dollars. Supposing that the ship was an Englishman, the viceroy came on board next morning, was made prisoner, and obliged to pay two thousand dollars as a ransom for himself and the other prisoners. After this he was sent ashore, with an express engagement to leave a ship to convey him and his companions to another port. Meanwhile, the pirates received intelligence that a vessel was to the leeward of the island, which they pursued and captured. But instead of performing their promise to the viceroy, which they could easily have done, they sent the Ostender along with some of their men to Madagascar, to inform their friends of their success, with instructions to prepare masts for the prize, and they soon followed, carrying two thousand negroes in the Portuguese vessel. Madagascar is an island larger than Great Britain, situated upon the eastern coast of Africa, abounding with all sorts of provisions such as oxen, goats, sheep, poultry, fish, citrons, oranges, tamarinds, dates, cocoa nuts, bananas, wax, honey, 
rice, cotton, indigo, and all other fruits common in that quarter of the globe, ebony of which lances are made, gums of several kinds, and many other valuable productions. Here, in St. Augustine's Bay, the ships sometimes stop to take in water, when they make the inner passage to India and do not intend to stop at Joanna. The pirates now divided their plunder, receiving forty-two diamonds per man, or in smaller proportion according to their magnitude. A foolish, jocular fellow, who had received a large diamond of the value of forty-two, was highly displeased, and so went and broke it in pieces, exclaiming that he had many more shares than either of them. Some, contended with their treasure, and unwilling to run the risk of losing what they possessed, and perhaps their lives also, resolved to remain with their friends at Madagascar, under the stipulation that the longest livers should enjoy all the booty. The number of adventurers now being lessened, they burned the viceroy, cleaned the Cassandra, and the remainder went on board her under the command of Taylor, whom we must leave for a little while, in order to give an account of the squadron which arrived in India in 1721. When the Commodore arrived at the Cape, he received a letter that had been written by the governor of Pondicherry to the governor of Madras, informing him that the pirates were strong in the Indian seas, that they had eleven sail and fifteen hundred men, but adding that many of them retired about that time to Brazil and Guinea, while others fortified themselves at Madagascar, Mauritius, Joanna, and Mahilla, and that a crew under the command of Condon, in a ship called the Dragon, had captured a vessel with thirteen lakhs of rupees on board, and, having divided their plunder, had taken up their residence with their friends at Madagascar. Upon receiving this intelligence, Commodore Matthews sailed for these islands as the most probable place of success. He endeavored to prevail on England at St. Mary's to communicate to him what information he could give respecting the pirates, but England declined, thinking that this would be almost to surrender at discretion. He then took up the guns of the Jubilee sloop that were on board, and the men of war made several cruises in search of the pirates, but to no purpose. The squadron was then sent down to Bombay, was saluted by the fort, and after these exploits returned home. The pirate Captain Taylor, in the Cassandra, now fitted up the Portuguese man-of-war and resolved upon another voyage to the Indies, but, informed that four men-of-war had been sent after the pirates in that quarter, he changed his determination and sailed for Africa. Arrived there, they put in a place near the Spirito Sancto, on the coast of Mano Matapa. As there was no correspondence by land nor any trade carried on by sea to this place, they thought that it would afford a safe retreat. To their astonishment, however, when they approached the shore, it being in the dusk of the evening, they were accosted by several shot. They immediately anchored, and in the morning saw that the shot had come from a small fort of six guns, which they attacked and destroyed. This small fort was erected by the Dutch East India Company a few weeks before, and committed to the care of a hundred and fifty men, the one half of whom had perished by sickness or other causes. Upon their petition, sixteen of these were admitted into the society of the pirates, and the rest would have also been received had they not been Dutchmen, to whom they had a rooted aversion. In this place they continued during four months refitting their vessels, and amusing themselves with all manner of diversions, until the scarcity of their provisions awakened them to industry and exertion. They, however, left several parcels of goods to the starving Dutchmen, which mine here joyfully exchanged for provisions with the next vessel that touched at that fort. Leaving that place, they were divided in opinion what course to steer. Some went on board the Portuguese prize, and, sailing from Madagascar, abandoned the pirate life, and others going on board the Cassandra, sailed for the Spanish West Indies. The mermaid man of war, returning from a convoy, got near the pirates, and would have attacked them, but a consultation being held, it was deemed inexpedient, and thus the pirates escaped. A sloop was, however, dispatched to Jamaica with the intelligence, and the Lancaster was sent after them. But they were some days too late, the pirates having, with all their riches, surrendered to the governor of Portobello. End of chapter 16 The Pirate's Own Book by Charles Elms Chapter 17 Account of the Lynn Pirates and Thomas Phil, who was buried in his cave by the Great Earthquake. In the year 1658 there was a great earthquake in New England. Some time previous, on one pleasant evening, a little after sunset, a small vessel was seen to anchor near the mouth of Saugus River. A boat was presently lowered from her side, into which four men descended, and moved up the river a considerable distance when they landed, and proceeded directly into the woods. They had been noticed by only a few individuals, but in those early times, when the people were surrounded by danger, and easily susceptible of alarm, 
Such an incident was well calculated to awaken suspicion, and in the course of the evening the intelligence was conveyed to many houses. In the morning the people naturally directed their eyes toward the shore, in search of the strange vessel, but she was gone, and no trace could be found either of her or her singular crew. It was afterwards ascertained that, on the morning, one of the men at the ironworks, on going into the foundry, discovered a paper on which was written, that if a quantity of shackles, handcuffs, hatchets, and other articles of iron manufacture, were made and deposited with secrecy, in a certain place in the woods which was particularly designated, an amount of silver in their full value would be found in their place. The articles were made in a few days, and placed in conformity with all the directions. On the next morning they were gone, and the money was found according to the promise. But though a watch had been kept, no vessel was seen. Some months afterwards the four men returned, and selected one of the most secluded and romantic spots in the woods of Saugus for their abode. The place of their retreat was a deep, narrow valley shut in on two sides by craggy, precipitous rocks, and shrouded on the others by thick pines, hemlocks, and cedars, between which there was only one small spot to which the rays of the sun at noon could penetrate. On climbing up the rude and almost perpendicular steps of the rock on either side, the eye could command a full view of the bay on the south, and a prospect of a considerable portion of the surrounding country. The place of their real retreat has ever since been called the Pirate's Glen, and they could not have selected a spot on the coast for many miles more favorable for the purposes both of concealment and observation. Even at this day, when the neighborhood has become thickly peopled, it is still a lonely and desolate place, and probably not one in a hundred of the inhabitants has ever descended into its silent and gloomy recess. There the pirates built a small hut, made a garden, and dug a well, the appearance of which is still visible. It has been supposed that they buried money, but though people have dug there, and in many other places, none has ever been found. After residing there some time, their retreat became known, and one of the king's cruisers appeared on the coast. They were traced to their glen and three of them were taken and carried to England, where it is probable they were executed. The other, whose name was Thomas Phil, escaped to a rock in the woods, about two miles to the north, in which was a spacious cavern, where the pirates had previously deposited some of their plunder. There the fugitive fixed his residence, and practiced the trade of a shoemaker, occasionally coming down to the village to obtain articles of sustenance. He continued his residence till the great earthquake in 1658, when the top of the rock was loosened, and crushed down into the mouth of the cavern, enclosing the unfortunate inmate in its unyielding prison. It has ever since been called the Pirate's Dungeon. A part of the cavern is still open, and is much visited by the curious. This rock is situated on a lofty range of thickly wooded hills, and commands an extensive view of the ocean, for fifty miles both north and south. A view from the top of it at once convinces the beholder that it would be impossible to select a place more convenient for the haunt of a gang of pirates. As all the vessels bound in and out of the harbors of Boston, Salem, and the adjacent ports, can be distinctly seen from its summit. Saugus River meanders among the hills a short distance to the south, and its numerous creeks, which extend among thick bushes, would afford good places to secrete boats, until such time as the pirates descried a sail, when they could instantly row down the river, attack and plunder them, and with their booty return to the cavern. This was evidently their mode of procedure— on an open space in front of the rock are still to be seen distinct traces of a small garden spot, and in the corner is a small well, full of stones and rubbish. The foundation of the wall round the garden remains, and shows that the spot was of a triangular shape, and was well selected for the cultivation of potatoes and common vegetables. The aperture in the rock is only about five feet in height, and extends only fifteen feet into the rock. The needle is strongly attracted around this, 
either by the presence of magnetic iron ore or some metallic substance buried in the interior. The Pirate's Glen, which is some distance from this, is one of nature's wildest and most picturesque spots, and the cellar of the Pirate's Hut remains to the present time, as does a clear space which was evidently cultivated at some remote period. End of chapter 17 THE PIRATE'S OWN BOOK BY CHARLES ELMS CHAPTER Eighteen: HISTORY OF THE LADRONE PIRATES AND THEIR DEPREDATIONS ON THE COAST OF CHINA WITH AN ACCOUNT OF THE ENTERPRISES AND VICTORIES OF MISTRESS CHANG, A FEMALE PIRATE The Ladrones, as they were christened by the Portuguese at Macau, were originally a disaffected set of Chinese that revolted against the oppression of the Mandarins. The first scene of their depredations was the western coast, about Cochin, China, where they began by attacking small trading vessels in rowboats, carrying from thirty to forty men each. They continued this system of piracy, and thrived and increased in numbers under it, for several years. At length, the fame of their success, and the oppression and horrid poverty and want that many of the lower orders of the Chinese laboured under, had an effect of augmenting their bands with astonishing rapidity. Fishermen and other destitute classes flocked by hundreds to their standard, and their audacity growing with their numbers, they not merely swept the coast, but blockaded all the rivers and attacked and took several large government war junks, mounting from ten to fifteen guns each. These junks being added to their shoals of boats, the pirates formed a tremendous fleet, which was always along shore so that no small vessel could safely trade on the coast. When they lacked prey on the sea, they laid the land under tribute. They were at first accustomed to go on shore and attack the maritime villages, but, becoming bolder, like the buccaneers, made long inland journeys, and surprised and plundered even large towns. An energetic attempt made by the Chinese government to destroy them only increased their strength, for in their first encounter with the pirates, Twenty-eight of the imperial junks struck, and the remaining twelve saved themselves by a precipitate retreat. The captured junks, fully equipped for war, were a great acquisition to the robbers, whose numbers now increased more rapidly than ever. They were in their plenitude of power in the year 1809, when Mr. Glasspool had the misfortune to fall into their hands, at which time that gentleman supposed their force to consist of seventy thousand men, navigating eight hundred large vessels and one thousand small ones, including rowboats. They were divided into six large squadrons under different flags, the red, the yellow, the green, the blue, the black, and the white. These wasps of the oceans, as the Chinese historian called them, were further distinguished by the names of their respective commanders. By these commanders a certain Cheng Yu had been most distinguished by his valour and conduct. By degrees, Chang obtained almost a supremacy of command over the whole united fleet, and so confident was this robber in his strength and daily augmenting means that he aspired to the dignity of a king, and went so far as openly to declare his patriotic intention of hurling the present Tartar family from the throne of China, and of restoring the ancient Chinese dynasty. But, unfortunately for the ambitious pirate, he perished in a heavy gale, and instead of placing a sovereign on the Chinese throne, he and his lofty aspirations were buried in the Yellow Sea. And now comes the most remarkable passage in the history of these pirates, remarkable with any class of men, but doubly so among the Chinese, who entertain more than the general oriental opinion of the inferiority of the fair sex. On the death of Ching Yi, his legitimate wife had sufficient influence over the freebooters to induce them to recognize her authority in the place of her deceased husband's, and she appointed one Pao as her lieutenant and prime minister, and provided that she should be considered the mistress or commander-in-chief of the united squadrons. This Pao had been a poor fisher-boy, picked up with his father at sea while fishing by Ching Yu, whose goodwill and favour he had fortune to captivate and by whom, before that pirate's death, he had been made a captain. Instead of declining under the rule of a woman, the pirates became more enterprising than ever. 
Cheng's widow was clever as well as brave, and so was her Lieutenant Pao. Between them they drew up a code of law for the better regulation of the freebooters. In this it was decreed that if any man went privately on shore, or did what they called transgressing the bars, he should have his ears slit in the presence of the whole fleet. A repetition of the same unlawful act was death. No one article, however trifling in value, was to be privately subtracted from the booty or plundered goods. Everything they took was regularly entered on the register of their stores. The following clause of Mistress Cheng's Code is still more delicate. No person shall debauch, at his pleasure, captive women, taken in the villages and open places, and brought on board ship. He must first request the ship's purser for permission, and then go aside in the ship's hold. To use violence against any woman, or to wed her without permission, shall be punished with death. By these means an admirable discipline was maintained on board the ships, and the peasantry on shore never let the pirates want for gunpowder, provisions, or any other necessity. On a piratical expedition, either to advance or retreat without orders, was a capital offence. Under these philosophical institutions, and the guidance of a woman, the robbers continued to scour the China Sea, plundering every vessel they came near. The great war mandarin, Kuo Lang Lin, sailed from the Boca Tigris into the sea to fight the pirates. Pao gave him a tremendous drubbing, and gained a splendid victory. In this battle which lasted from morning to night, the mandarin Kuo Lang Lin, a desperate fellow himself, levelled a gun at Pao, who fell on the deck as the piece went off. His disheartened crew concluding it was all over with him. But Pao was quick-eyed. He had seen the unfriendly intention of the Mandarin, and thrown himself down. The great Mandarin was soon after taken with fifteen junks. Three were sunk. The pirate lieutenant would have dealt mercifully with him, but the fierce old man suddenly seized him by the hair on the crown of his head, and grinned at him so that he might provoke him to slay him. But even then Pao spoke kindly to him. Upon this he committed suicide, being seventy years of age. After several victories and reverses, the Chinese historian says our men of war, escorting some merchant ships, happened to meet the pirate chief nicknamed the Jewel of the Crew, cruising at sea. The traders became exceedingly frightened, but our commander said, This not being the flag of our widow Cheng Yi, we are a match for them, therefore we will attack and conquer them. Then ensued a battle. They attacked each other with guns and stones, and many people were killed and wounded. The fighting ceased towards evening, and began again next morning. The pirates and the men of war were very close to each other, and they boasted mutually about their strength and valour. The traders remained at some distance. They saw the pirates mixing gunpowder in their beverage. They looked instantly red about the face and the eyes, and then fought desperately. This fighting continued three days and nights incessantly. At last, becoming tired on both sides, they separated. To understand this inglorious bulletin, the reader must remember that many of the combatants only handled bows and arrows, and pelted stones, and that Chinese powder and guns are both exceedingly bad. The pathos of the conclusion does somewhat remind one of the Irishman's dispatch during the American War. It was a bloody battle while it lasted, and the sergeant of marines lost his cartouche-box. The Admiral Ting River was sent to sea against them. This man was surprised at anchor by the ever-vigilant Pao, to whom many fishermen and other people on the coast must have acted as friendly spies. Seeing escape impossible, and that his officers stood pale and inactive by the flagstaff, the Admiral conjured them by their fathers and mothers, their wives and children, and by the hopes and brilliant reward if they succeeded, and of vengeance if they perished, to do their duty, and the combat began. The Admiral had the good fortune at the onset of killing, with one of his great guns, the pirate captain, the jewel of the crew. But the robbers swarmed thicker and thicker around him, and when the dreaded pow lay him by the board, without help or hope, the Mandarin killed himself. An immense number of his men perished in the sea, and twenty-five vessels were lost. After his defeat, it was resolved by the Chinese government to cut off all their supplies of food and starve them out. 
all vessels that were in port were ordered to remain there, and those at sea or on the coast ordered to return with all speed. But the pirates, full of confidence, now resolved to attack the harbours themselves, and to ascend the rivers which are navigable for many miles up country, and rob the villages. The consternation was great when the Chinese saw them venturing above the government forts. The pirates separated, Mistress Cheng plundering in one place, Pao in another, and Opo Tai in another. It was at this time that Mr. Glasspool had the ill fortune to fall into their power. This gentleman, then an officer in the East India Company's ship, the Marquis of Ely, which was anchored under an island about twelve miles from Macau, was ordered to proceed to the latter place with a boat to procure a pilot. He left the ship in one of the cutters with seven British seamen well armed on the 17th of September, 1809. He reached Macau in safety, and having done his business there and procured a pilot, returned towards the ship the following day. But unfortunately, the ship had weighed anchor, and was under sail, and in consequence of squally weather accompanied with thick fogs, the boat could not reach her, and Mr. Glasspool and his men, and the pilot, were left at sea in an open boat. Our situation, says that gentleman, was truly distressing, night closing fast with a threatening appearance, blowing fresh, with a hard rain and a heavy sea. Our boat, very leaky, without a compass, anchor, or provisions, and drifting fast on a lee shore, surrounded with dangerous rocks, and inhabited by the most barbarous pirates. After suffering dreadfully for three whole days, Mr. Glasspool, by the advice of the pilot, made for a narrow channel, where he presently discovered three large boats at anchor, which, on seeing the English boat, weighed and made sail towards it. The pilot told Mr. Glasspool they were ladrones, and that if they captured the boat they would certainly put them all to death. After rowing tremendously for six hours they escaped these boats, but on the following morning, falling in with a large fleet of the pirates, which the English mistook for fishing boats, they were captured. About twenty savage-looking villains, said Mr. Glasspool, who were stowed at the bottom of the boat, leapt on board us. They were armed with short swords in either hand, one of which they laid upon our necks, and pointed the other to our breasts, keeping their eyes fixed on the officer, waiting his signal to cut or desist. Seeing we were incapable of making any resistance, the officer sheathed his sword, and the other immediately followed his example. They then dragged us into their boat, and carried us on board one of their junks, with the most savage demonstrations of joy, and, as we supposed, to torture us and put us to a cruel death. When on board the junk, they rifled the Englishmen, and brought heavy chains to chain them to the deck. At this time a boat came and took me, with one of my men and an interpreter, on board the chief's vessel. I was then taken before the chief. He was seated on deck in a large chair, dressed in purple silk with a black turban on. He appeared to be about thirty years of age, a stout, commanding-looking man. He took me by the coat, and drew me close to him then questioned the interpreter very strictly, asking who we were, and what was our business in that part of the country. I told him to say we were Englishmen, in distress, having been four days at sea without provision. This he would not credit, but said we were bad men, and that he would put us all to death, and then ordered some men to put the interpreter to the torture until he confessed the truth. Upon this occasion a ladrone, who had been once to England and spoke a few words of English, came to the chief, and told him we were really Englishmen, that we had plenty of money, adding that the buttons on my coat were gold. The chief then ordered us some coarse brown rice, of which we made a tolerable meal, having eaten nothing for nearly four days except a few green oranges. During our repast, a number of ladrones crowded round us, examining our clothes and hair, and giving us every possible annoyance. Several of them brought swords, and laid them on our necks, making signs that they would soon take us on shore, and cut us in pieces, which, I am sorry to say, was the fate of some hundreds during my captivity. I was now summoned before the chief, who had been conversing with the interpreter. He said I must write to my captain, and tell him, if he did not send a hundred thousand dollars for our ransom, in ten days, he would put us all to death. After vainly expostulating to lessen the ransom, 
Mr. Glasspool wrote the letter, and a small boat came alongside it and took it to Macau. Early in the night the fleet sailed, and anchored about one o'clock the following day in a bay under the island of Lantau, where the head admiral of the Ladrones, our acquaintance Pau, was lying at anchor, with about two hundred vessels and a Portuguese brig they had captured a few days before, and the captain and part of the crew of which they had murdered. Early the next morning a fishing-boat came to inquire if they had captured a European boat. They came to the vessel the English were in. One of the boatmen spoke a few words of English, and told me that he had a Ladrone pass, and was sent by our captain in search of us. I was rather surprised to find he had no letter. He appeared to be well acquainted with the chief, and remained in the cabin smoking opium, and playing cards all the day. In the evening I was summoned with the interpreter before the chief. He questioned us in much milder tone, saying he now believed we were Englishmen, a people he wished to be friendly with, and that if our captain would lend him seventy thousand dollars till he returned from his cruise up the river, he would repay him, and send us all to Macau. I assured him it was useless writing on these terms, and unless our ransom was speedily settled, the English fleet would sail, and render our enlargement altogether ineffectual. He remained determined, and said if it were not sent, he would keep us, and make us fight, or put us to death. I accordingly wrote, and gave my letter to the man belonging to the boat before mentioned. He said he could not return with an answer in less than five days. The chief now gave me the letter I wrote when first taken. I have never been able to ascertain his reasons for detaining it, but supposed he dared not negotiate for our ransom, without orders from the head admiral, who I understood was sorry at our being captured. He said the English ships would join the mandarins and attack them. While the fleet lay here, one night the Portuguese who were left in the captured brig murdered the ladrones that were on board of her, cut the cables, and fortunately escaped through the darkness of the night. At daylight the next morning the fleet, amounting to about five hundred sail of different sizes, weighed to proceed on their intended cruise up the rivers, to levy contributions on the towns and villages. It is impossible to describe what my feelings at this critical time, having received no answer to my letters, and the fleet under way to sail, hundreds of miles up a country never visited by Europeans, there to remain probably for many months, which would render all opportunities for negotiating our enlargement totally ineffectual, as the only method of communication is by boats that have to pass from the Ladrones, and they dare not venture above twenty miles from Macau, being obliged to come and go in the night to avoid the mandarins. And if these boats should be detected in having any intercourse with the Ladrones, they are immediately put to death, and all their relations, though they had not joined in the crime, share in the punishment, in order that not a single person of their families should be left to imitate the crimes, or avenge their death. The following is a very touching incident in Mr. Glasspool's narrative. Wednesday, the 26th of September, at daylight, we passed in sight of our own ships at anchor under the island of Chung Po. The chief then called me, pointing to the ships, and told the interpreter to tell us to look at them, for we should never see them again. About noon we entered a river to the westward of the bog. Three or four miles from the entrance we passed a large town situated on the side of a beautiful hill, which is tributary to the Ladrones. The inhabitants saluted them with songs as they passed. After committing numerous minor robberies, the Ladrones now prepared to attack a town with a formidable force, collected in rowboats from the different vessels. They sent a messenger to the town demanding a tribute of ten thousand dollars annually, saying, if these terms were not complied with, they would land, destroy the town, and murder all the inhabitants, which they certainly would have done had the town laid in a more advantageous situation for their purpose, and, being placed out of reach of their shot, they allowed them to come to terms. The inhabitants agreed to pay six thousand dollars, which they were to collect by the time of our return down the river. This finesse had the desired effect, for during our absence they mounted a few guns on a hill, which commanded the passage, and gave us in lieu of the dollars a warm salute on our return. October the 1st, the fleet weighed in the night, dropped by the tide up the river, and anchored very quietly before a town surrounded by a thick wood. Early in the morning the Ladrones assembled in rowboats and landed. 
they gave a shout, and rushed into the town, sword in hand. The inhabitants fled to the adjacent hills, in numbers apparently superior to the Ladrones. We may easily imagine to ourselves the horror with which these miserable people must be seized, on being obliged to leave their homes, and everything dear to them. It was a most melancholy sight to see women in tears, clasping their infants in their arms, and imploring mercy for them from those brutal robbers. The old and the sick, who were unable to fly or make resistance, were either made prisoners, or most inhumanely butchered. The boats continued passing and repassing from the junks to the shore, in quick succession laden with booty, and the men besmeared with blood. Two hundred and fifty women and several children were made prisoners, and sent on board different vessels. They were unable to escape with the men, owing to that abominable practice of cramping their feet. Several of them were not able to move without assistance. In fact, they might all be said to totter rather than to walk. Twenty of these poor women were sent on board the vessel I was in. They were hauled on board by the hair, and treated in a most savage manner. When the chief came on board, he questioned them respecting the circumstances of their friends, and demanded ransoms accordingly, from six thousand to six hundred dollars each. He ordered them a berth on deck, at the after part of the vessel, where they had nothing to shelter them from the weather, which at this time was very variable, the days excessively hot, and the nights cold with heavy rains. The town being plundered of everything valuable, it was set on fire, and reduced to ashes by the morning. The fleet remained here three days, negotiating for the ransom of the prisoners, and plundering the fish-tanks and gardens. During all this time the Chinese never ventured from the hills, though they were frequently not more than a hundred of drones on shore at a time, and I am sure the people on the hills exceeded ten times that number. On the tenth we formed a junction with the Black Squadron, and, proceeding many miles up a wide and beautiful river, passing several ruins of villages that had been destroyed by the Black Squadron, on the 17th the fleet anchored abreast four mud batteries, which defended a town, so entirely surrounded with wood that it was impossible to form any idea of its size. The weather was very hazy, with hard squalls of rain. The Ladrones remained perfectly quiet for two days. On the third day the forts commenced a brisk fire for several hours. The Ladrones did not return a single shot, but weighed in the night, and dropped down the river. The reasons they gave for not attacking the town, or returning the fire, were that Joss had not promised them success. They are very superstitious, and consult their idol on all occasions. If his omens are good, they will undertake the most daring enterprises. The fleet now anchored opposite the ruins of the town, where the women had been made prisoners. Here we remained five or six days, during which time about a hundred of the women were ransomed. The remainder were offered for sale among the Ladrones, for forty dollars each. The woman is considered the lawful wife of the purchaser, who would be put to death if he discarded her. Several of them leapt overboard and drowned themselves, rather than submit to such infamous degradation. Mai Ying, the wife of Ki Chu Yang, was very beautiful and a pirate being about to seize her by the head, she abused him exceedingly. The pirate bound her to the yard-arm, but on abusing him yet more, the pirate dragged her down and broke two of her teeth, which filled her mouth and jaws with blood. The pirate sprang up again to bind her. Ying allowed him to approach, but as soon as he came nearer her, she laid hold of his garments with her bleeding mouth, and threw both him and herself into the river, where they were both drowned. The remaining captives of both sexes were, after some months, liberated, on having paid a ransom of fifteen thousand liang, or ounces of silver. The fleet then weighed, continues Mr. Glasspool, and made sail down the river to receive the ransom from the town before mentioned. As we passed the hill they fired several shots at us, but without effect. The Ladrones were much exasperated and determined to revenge themselves. They dropped out of reach of their shot, and anchored. Every junk sent about a hundred men each on shore, to cut paddy and destroy their orange groves, which were most effectually performed for several miles down the river. During our stay here they received information of nine boats lying up a creek, laden with paddy. Boats were immediately dispatched after them. Next morning these boats were brought to the fleet, 
ten or twelve men were taken in them. As these had made no resistance, the chief said he would allow them to become ladrones, if they agreed to take the usual oaths before Joss. Three or four of them refused to comply, for which they were punished in the following cruel manner. Their hands were tied behind their back, a rope from the masthead rove through their arms, and hoisted three or four feet from the deck, and five or six men flogged them with their rattans, twisted together till they were apparently dead, then hoisted them up to the masthead, and left them hanging nearly an hour, then lowered them down, and repeated the punishment, till they died, or complied with the oath. On the 28th of October, I received a letter from Captain K., brought by a fisherman, who had told him he would give us all back for three thousand dollars. He advised me to offer three thousand, and if not accepted, extend it to four, but not further, as it was bad policy to offer much at first. At the same time, assuring me we should be liberated, let the ransom be what it would, I offered the chief the three thousand, which he disdainfully refused, saying it was not to be played with, and unless they sent ten thousand dollars and two large guns with several casts of gunpowder, he would soon put us to death. I wrote to Captain K, and informed him of the chief's determination, requesting, if an opportunity offered, to send us a shift of clothes, for which it may be easily imagined we were much distressed, having been seven weeks without a shift, although constantly exposed to the weather, and of course frequently wet. On the 1st of November the fleet sailed up a narrow river, and anchored at night within two miles of a town called Little Wampoa. In front of it was a small fort, and several Mandarin vessels lying in the harbour. The chief sent the interpreter to me, saying, I must order my men to make cartridges and clean their muskets, ready to go on shore in the morning. I ensured the interpreter I should give the men no such orders, and they must please themselves. Soon after the chief came on board, threatening to put us all to a cruel death if we refused to obey his orders. For my own part, I remained determined, and advised the men not to comply, as I thought by making ourselves useful we should be accounted too valuable. A few hours afterwards he sent to me again, saying that if myself and the quartermaster would assist them at the great guns, that if also the rest of the men went on shore and succeeded in taking the place, he would then take the money offered for our ransom, and give them twenty dollars for each Chinaman's head they cut off. To these proposals we cheerfully acceded, in hopes of facilitating our deliverance. The Mandarin vessels continued firing, having blocked up the entrance of the harbour to prevent the Ladrone boats entering. At this the Ladrones were much exasperated, and about three hundred of them swam on shore, with a short sword lashed close under each arm. They then ran along the banks of the river till they came abreast of the vessels, and then swam off again and boarded them. The Chinese thus attacked, leapt overboard and endeavoured to reach the opposite shore. The Ladrones followed, and cut the greater number of them to pieces in the water. They next towed the vessels out of the harbour, and attacked the town with increased fury. The inhabitants fought about a quarter of an hour, and then retreated to an adjacent hill, from which they were soon driven with great slaughter. After this the Ladrones returned, and plundered the town, every boat leaving with its lading. The Chinese on the hills, perceiving most of the boats were off, rallied and retook the town, after killing nearly two hundred Ladrones. One of my men was unfortunately lost in this dreadful massacre. The Ladrones landed a second time, drove the Chinese out of the town, then reduced it to ashes, and put all their prisoners to death without regard of either age or sex. I must not omit to mention a most horrid, though ludicrous, circumstance which happened at this place. The Ladrones were paid by their chief ten dollars for every Chinaman's head they produced. One of my men, turning the corner of a street, was met by a Ladrone running furiously after a Chinese. He had a drawn sword in his hand, and two Chinaman's heads which he had cut off, tied by their tails and slung round his neck. I was witness myself to some of them producing five or six to obtain payment. On the 4th of November an order arrived from the Admiral for the fleet to proceed immediately to Lantau, where he was lying with only two vessels, and three Portuguese ships and a brig constantly annoying him. Several sail of Mandarin vessels were daily expected. The fleet weighed and proceeded towards Lantau. 
on passing the island of Lin Tin, three ships and a brig gave chase to us. The Ladrones prepared to board, but night closing we lost sight of them. I am convinced they altered their course and stood from us. These vessels were in the pay of the Chinese government, and styled themselves the Invincible Squadron, cruising in the river Tigris to annihilate the Ladrones. On the fifth, in the morning, the Red Squadron anchored in the bay under Lantau. The Black Squadron stood to the eastward. In the afternoon of the 8th of November, four ships, a brig and a schooner, came off the mouth of the bay. At first the pirates were much alarmed, supposing them to be English vessels come to rescue us. Some of them threatened to hang us from the masthead for them to fire at, and with much difficulty we persuaded them that they were Portuguese. The Ladrones had only seven junks in a fit state for action. These they hauled outside and moored them head and stern across the bay and manned all the boats belonging to the repairing vessels ready for boarding. The Portuguese observing these manoeuvres hove to, and communicated by boats. Soon afterwards they made sail, each ship firing her broadside as she passed, but without effect, the shot falling far short. The Ladrones did not return a single shot, but waved their colours and threw up their rockets, to induce them to come further in, which they might easily have done, the outside junks lying in four fathoms of water, which I sounded myself, though the Portuguese in their letters to Macau lamented that there was not sufficient water for them to engage closer, but that they would certainly prevent their escaping before the Mandarin fleet arrived. On the 20th of November, early in the morning, discovered an immense fleet of Mandarin vessels standing for the bay. On nearing us, they formed a line and stood close in. Each vessel, as she discharged her guns, tacked to join the rear and reload. They kept up a constant fire for about two hours, when one of their largest vessels was blown up by a firebrand thrown from a Ladrone junk, after which they kept at a more respectful distance, but continued firing without intermission till the twenty-first at night, when it fell calm. The Ladrones towed out seven large vessels, with about two hundred rowboats to board them but a breeze springing up, they made sail and escaped. The Ladrones returned into the bay and anchored. The Portuguese and Mandarins followed and continued a heavy cannonading during the night and the next day. The vessel I was in had her foremast shot away, which they supplied very expeditiously by taking a mainmast from a smaller vessel. On the 23rd, in the evening, it again fell calm. The Ladrones towed out fifteen junks in two divisions, with the intention of surrounding them, which was nearly effected, having come up with and boarded one, when a breeze suddenly sprang up. The captured vessel mounted twenty-two guns. Most of her crew leapt overboard, sixty or seventy were taken, immediately cut to pieces and thrown into the river. Early in the morning the Ladrones returned into the bay, and anchored in the same situation as before. The Portuguese and Mandarins followed, keeping up a constant fire. The Ladrones never returned a single shot, but always kept in readiness to board, and the Portuguese were careful never to allow them an opportunity. On the 28th, at night, they sent eight fire vessels, which, if properly constructed, must have done great execution, having every advantage they could wish for to effect their purpose. A strong breeze and a tide directed into the bay and the vessels lying so close together that it was impossible to miss them. On their first appearance, the Ladrones gave a general shout, supposing them to be Mandarin vessels on fire, but were very soon convinced of their mistake. They came very regularly into the centre of the fleet, two and two, burning furiously. One of them came alongside the vessel I was in, but they succeeded in booming her off. She appeared to be a vessel of about thirty tons, her hold was filled with straw and wood, and there were a few small boxes of combustibles on her deck, which exploded alongside of us without doing any damage. The Ladrones, however, towed them all on shore, extinguished the fire, and broke them up for firewood. The Portuguese claimed the credit of constructing these destructive machines, and actually sent a dispatch to the governor of Macau, saying they had destroyed at least one third of the Ladrones' fleet and hoped soon to effect their purpose by totally annihilating them. On the 29th of November, the Ladrones being all ready for sea, they weighed and stood boldly by, bidding defiance to the invincible squadron and imperial fleet, 
consisting of 93 war junks, six Portuguese ships, a brig, and a schooner. Immediately after the Ladrones weighed, they made all sail. The Ladrones chased them two or three hours, keeping up a constant fire. Finding they did not come up with them, they hauled their wind and stood to the eastward. Thus terminated the boasted blockade, which lasted nine days, during which time the Ladrones completed all their repairs. In this action not a single Ladrone vessel was destroyed, and their loss was about thirty or forty men. An American was also killed, one of three that remained out of the eight taken in a schooner. I had two very narrow escapes. The first, a twelve-pounder shot, fell within three or four feet of me. Another took a piece out of a small brass swivel on which I was standing. The chief's wife frequently sprinkled me with garlic water, which they considered an ineffectual charm against shot. The fleet continued under sail all night, steering towards the eastward. In the morning they anchored in a large bay, surrounded by lofty and barren mountains. On the 2nd of December I received a letter from Lieutenant Morn, commander of the Honourable Company's cruiser Antelope, saying that he had the ransom on board, and had been three days cruising after us, and wished me to settle with the chief on the securest method of delivering it. The chief agreed to send us in a small gunboat till we came within sight of the antelope. Then the comprador's boat was to bring the ransom and receive us. I was so agitated at receiving this joyful news that it was with difficulty I could scrawl about two or three lines to inform Lieutenant Morn of the arrangements I had made. We were all so deeply affected by the gratifying tidings that we seldom closed our eyes, but continued watching day and night for the boat. On the 6th she returned with Lieutenant Morn's answer, saying he would respect any single boat, but would not allow the fleet to approach him. The chief then, according to his first proposal, ordered a gunboat to take us, and with no small degree of pleasure we left the Ladrone fleet about four o'clock in the afternoon. At 1 p.m. saw the antelope under all sail, standing towards us. The Ladrone boat immediately anchored, and dispatched the Comprador's boat for the ransom saying that if she approached nearer they would return to the fleet, and they were just weighing when she shortened sail and anchored about two miles from us. The boat did not reach her till late in the afternoon, owing to the tides being strong against her. She received the ransom and left the antelope just before dark. A mandarin boat that had been lying concealed under the land and watching their manoeuvres gave chase to her, and was within a few fathoms of taking her, when she saw a light which the Ladrones answered, and the Mandarin hauled off. Our situation was now a critical one. The ransom was in the hands of the Ladrones, and the Comprador dare not return with us for fear of a second attack from the Mandarin boat. The Ladrones would not wait till morning, so we were obliged to return with them to the fleet. In the morning the chief inspected the ransom, which consisted of the following articles. Two bales of superfine cloth, two chests of opium, two casks of gunpowder, and a telescope, the rest in dollars. He objected to the telescope not being new, and said he should detain one of us till another was sent, or a hundred dollars in lieu of it. The comprador, however, agreed with him for the hundred dollars. Everything being at length settled, the chief ordered two gunboats to convey us near the antelope. We saw her before dusk, when the Ladrone boat left us, we had the inexpressible pleasure of arriving on board the Antelope at 7 p.m., when we were most cordially received, and heartily congratulated on our safe and happy deliverance from a miserable captivity, which we'd endured for eleven weeks and three days. Signed, Richard Glasspool, China, December the 8th, 1809. The Ladrones have no settled residence on shore, but live constantly in their vessels, the after-part is appropriated to the captain and his wives. He generally has five or six. With respect to the conjugal rights, they are religiously strict. No person is allowed to have a woman on board unless married to her according to their laws. Every man is allowed a small berth, about four feet square, where he stows with his wife and family. From the number of souls crowded in so small a space, it must naturally be supposed that they are horridly dirty which is evidently the case, and their vessels swarm with all kind of vermin. Rats in particular, which they encourage to breed, and eat as great delicacies. 
In fact, there are very few creatures they will not eat. During our captivity, we lived three weeks on caterpillars boiled with rice. They are much addicted to gambling and spend all their leisure hours at cards and smoking opium. At the time of Mr. Glasspool's liberation, the pirates were at the height of their power. After such repeated victories over the Mandarin ships, they had set at naught the imperial allies, the Portuguese, and not only the coast, but the rivers of the Celestial Empire seemed to be at their discretion. And yet their formidable association did not many months survive this event. It was not, however, defeat that reduced it to the obedience of the laws. On the contrary, that extraordinary woman, the widow of Cheng Yi, and the daring power were victorious and more powerful than ever when dissensions broke out amongst the pirates themselves. Ever since the favour of the chieftainess had elevated power to the general command, there had been enmity and altercations between him and the chief, Opo Tai, who commanded one of the flags or divisions of the fleet, and it was only by the deference and respect they both owed to Cheng Yi's widow that they had been prevented from turning their arms against each other long before. At length, when the brave power was surprised and cooped up by a strong blockading force of the emperor's ships, Opo Tai showed all his deadly spite and refused to obey the orders of Pao, and even of the chieftainess, which were that he should sail to the relief of his rival. Pao, with his bravery and usual good fortune, broke through the blockade, but when he gave in contact with Opo Tai, his rage was too violent to be restrained. Opo Tai at first pleaded that his means and strength had been insufficient to do what had been expected of him, but concluded by saying, Am I bound to come and join the forces of Pao? Would you then separate before us? cried Pao, more enraged than ever. Opotai answered, I will not separate myself. Pao, why then do you not obey the orders of the wife of Cheng Yi and my own? What is this else than separation, that you do not come to assist me when I am surrounded by the enemy? I have sworn it that I will destroy thee, wicked man, that I may do away with this soreness on my back. The summons of power when blockaded to Opo Tai was in language equally figurative. I am harassed by the government's officers outside in the sea. Lips and teeth must help one another. If the lips are cut away, the teeth will feel cold. How shall I alone be able to fight the government forces? You should therefore come to the head of your crew to attack the government squadron in the rear. I will then come out of my station and make an attack in front. The enemy be so taken in the front and rear will, even supposing we cannot master him, certainly be thrown into disorder. The angry words of Pao were followed by others, and then by blows. Pao, though at the moment far inferior in force, first began the fight, and ultimately sustained a sanguinary defeat, and the loss of sixteen vessels. Our loathing for this cruel, detestable race must be increased by the fact that the victors massacred all their prisoners, or three hundred men. This was the death-blow to the confederacy which had so long defied the emperor's power, and which might have effected his dethronement. Opo Tai, dreading the vengeance of Pao and his mistress, Cheng Yi's widow, whose united forces would have quintupled his own, gained over his men to his views, and proffered a submission to government, on condition of free pardon and a proper provision for all. The petition of the pirates is so curious a production, and so characteristic of the Chinese that it deserves to be inserted at length. It is my humble opinion that all robbers of an overwhelming force, whether they had their origin from this or any other course, have felt the humanity of government at different times. Liang Shang, who three years plundered the city, was nevertheless pardoned, and at last made a minister of state. Hua Kang often challenged the arms of the country, and he was suffered to live, and at last made a cornerstone of the empire. Zhu Ming pardoned seven times Mang Huao, and Quang Kung three times set Chao Chao at liberty. Ma Huen persuaded not the exhausted robbers, and Yo Fai killed not those who made their submission. There are many instances of such transactions both in former and recent times, by which the country was strengthened, and government increased its power. We now live in a very populous age. Some of us could not agree with their relations, and were driven out like noxious weeds. Some, after having tried all they could, without being able to provide for themselves, 
at last joined bad society. Some lost their property by shipwrecks. Some withdrew into this watery empire to escape from punishment. In such a way, those who in the beginning were only three or five were in the course of time increased to a thousand or ten thousand, and so it went on increasing every year. Would it not have been wonderful if such a multitude, being in want of their daily bread, had not resorted to plunder and robbery to gain their subsistence, since they could not in any other manner be saved from famine? It was from necessity that the laws of the empire were violated, and the merchants robbed of their goods. Being deprived of our land and of our native places, having no house or home to resort to, and relying only on the chance of wind and water, even could we for a moment forget our griefs, we might fall in with a man of war, who with stones, darts, and guns would knock out our brains. Even if we dared to sail up a stream, and boldly go on, with anxiety of mind under wind, rain, and stormy weather, we must everywhere prepare for fighting. Whether we went to the east or to the west, and after having felt all the hardships of the sea, the night dew was our only dwelling, and the rude wind our meal. But now we will avoid these perils, leave our connections, and desert our comrades. We will make our submission. The power of government knows no bounds. It reaches to the islands in the sea, and every man is afraid, and sighs. Oh, we must be destroyed by our crimes. None can escape who opposeth the laws of the government. May you then feel compassion for those who are deserving of death. May you sustain us by your humanity. The government that had made so many lamentable displays of its weakness were glad to make an unreal parade of its mercy. It was but too unhappy to grant all the conditions instantly, and in the fulsome language of its historians, feeling that compassion is the way of heaven, that it is the right way to govern by righteousness, it therefore redeemed these pirates from destruction, and pardoned their former crimes. Opotai, however, then struck his free flag, and the pirates were hardly in the power of the Chinese, when it was proposed by many that they should all be treacherously murdered. The governor happened to be more honourable and humane, or probably only more politic than those who had made this foul proposal. He knew that such a bloody breach of faith would forever prevent the pirates still in arms from voluntarily submitting. He knew equally well, even weakened as they were by Opotai's defection, that the government could not reduce them by force, and he thought by keeping his faith with them he might turn the force of those who had submitted against those who still held out and so destroy the pirates with the pirates. Consequently, the eight thousand men it had been proposed to cut off in cold blood were allowed to remain uninjured, and their leader, Opotai, having changed his name to that of Ho Bin, or the Lustre of Instruction, was elevated to the rank of an imperial officer. The widow of Cheng Yi and her favourite Pao continued for some months to pillage the coast, and to beat the Chinese and the Mandarin's troops and ships, and seemed almost as strong as before the separation of Opotai's flag. But that example was probably operating in the minds of many of the outlaws, and finally the lawless heroine herself, who was the spirit that kept the complicated body together, seeing that Opotai had been made a government officer, and that he continued to prosper, began also to think of making her submission. I am, said she, ten times stronger than Opotai, and government will perhaps, if I submit, act towards me as they have done with Opotai. A rumour of her intentions having reached shore, the Mandarin sent off a Captain Chow, a doctor of Macau, who, said the historian, being already well acquainted with the pirates, did not need any introduction, to enter on preliminaries with them. When the worthy practitioner presented himself to Pao, that friend concluded he had been committing some crime, and had come for safety to that general refugium peccatorum, the pirate fleet. The doctor explained, and assured the chief, that if he would submit, government was inclined to treat him, and his, far more favourably and more honourably than Opotai. But if he continued to resist, not only a general arming of all the coasts and rivers, but Opotai was to proceed against him. At this part of his narrative, our Chinese historian is again so curious that I shall quote his words at length. When Fai Hyang Chao came to Pao, he said, Friend Pao, 
do you know why I come to you? How? Thou hast committed some crime, and comest to me for protection. Chow. By no means. How? You will then know how it stands concerning the report about our submission, if it is true or false. Chow. You are again wrong here, sir. What are you in comparison with Opo Tai? Pow. Who is bold enough to compare me with Opo Tai? Chow. I know very well that Opo Tai could not come up to you, sir. But I mean only that since Opo Tai has made his submission, since he has got his pardon and been created a government officer, how would it be if you with your whole crew were also to submit, and if His Excellency should desire to treat you in the same manner, and to give you the same rank as Opo Tai? Your submission would produce more joy to government than the submission of Opo Tai. You should not wait for wisdom to act wisely. You should make up your mind to submit to the government with all your followers. I will assist you in every respect. It would be the means of securing your own happiness and the lives of all your adherents. Chang Pao remained like a statue without motion, and Fai Hueng Chao went on to say, You should think about this affair in time, and not stay till the last moment. Is it not clear that Opo Tai, since you could not agree together, has joined government? He, being enraged against you, will fight, united with the forces of the government, for your destruction. And who could help you, so that you might overcome your enemies? If Opo Tai could before vanquish you quite alone, how much more can he now, when he is united with the government? Opo Tai will then satisfy his hatred against you, and you yourself will soon be taken, either at Wei Chao, or at Niao Chao. If the merchant vessels of Hu Chao, the boats of Quang Chao, and all the fishing vessels unite together to surround and attack you in the open sea, you will certainly have enough to do. But even supposing they should not attack you, you will soon feel the want of provisions to sustain you and all your followers. It is always wisdom to provide before things happen. Stupidity and folly never think about future events. It is too late to reflect upon events when things have happened. You should therefore consider this matter in time. Pao was puzzled, but after being closeted for some time with his mistress, Cheng Yi's widow, who gave her high permission for him to make arrangements with Dr. Chow, he said he would repair with his fleet to the Boca Tigris, and there communicate personally with the organs of government. After two visits had been paid to the pirate fleets by two inferior mandarins, who carried the inferior proclamation of free pardon, and who, at the order of Ching Yi's widow, were treated to a sumptuous banquet by Pao, the governor-general of the province went himself in one vessel to the pirate ships that occupied a line of ten li off the mouth of the river. As the governor approached, the pirates hoisted their flags, played on their instruments, and fired their guns, so that the smoke rose in clouds, and then bent sail to meet him. On this, the dense population that were ranged thousands after thousands along the shore to witness the important reconciliation became sorely alarmed, and the governor-general seemed to have had a strong inclination to run away. But in brief space of time, the long-dreaded widow of Cheng Yi, supported by the Lieutenant Pao, and followed by three other of her principal commanders, mounted the side of the governor's ship, and rushed through the smoke to the spot where His Excellency was stationed. When they fell on their hands and knees, shed tears, knocked their heads on the deck before him, and received his gracious pardon, and promised for future kind treatment. They then withdrew, satisfied, having promised to give in a list of their ships, and of all else they possessed within three days. But the sudden apparition of some large Portuguese ships and some government war junks made the pirates suspect treachery. They immediately set sail, and negotiations were interrupted for several days. They were at last concluded by the boldness of their female leader. If the Governor-General, said this heroine, a man of the highest rank, could come out to us quite alone, why should not I, a mean woman, go to the officers of government? If there be danger in it, I take it all on myself. No person among you need trouble himself about me. My mind is made up, and I will go to Canton. Pao said, If the widow of Cheng Yi goes, we must all fix a time for her return. If this pass without our obtaining any information, we must collect all our forces and go before Canton. This is my opinion as to what ought to be done, comrades, 
let me hear yours. The pirates then struck with the intrepidity of their chieftainess, and loving her more than ever, answered, Friend Pow, we have heard thy opinion, but we think it better to wait for the news here, on the water, than to send the wife of Cheng Yi alone to be killed. Nor would they allow her to leave the fleet. Matters were in this state of indecision, when the two inferior mandarins, who had before visited the pirates, ventured out to repeat their visit. These officers protested no treachery had been intended, and pledged themselves that if the widow of Ching Yi would repair to the governor, she would be kindly received, and everything settled to their heart's satisfaction. With this, in the language of our old ballads, up spoke Miss Cheng. You say well, gentlemen, and I will go myself to Canton with some of our other ladies, accompanied by you. And accordingly, she and a number of the pirates' wives and their children went fearlessly to Canton, arranged everything, and found that they had not been deceived. The fleet soon followed. On its arrival, every vessel was supplied with pork and with wine, and every man, in lieu it must be supposed of the share of the vessels and plundered property he resigned, received at the same time a bill for a certain quantity of money. Those who wished it could join the military force of government for pursuing the remaining pirates, and those who objected dispersed and withdrew into the country. This is the manner in which the great red squadron of the pirates was pacified. The valiant Pao, following the example of his rival O Po Tai, entered into the service of government, and proceeded against such of his former associates and friends as would not accept the pardon offered them. There was some hard fighting, but the two renegados successfully took the chief Shi Ul, forced the redoubtable captain, styled the Scourge of the Eastern Ocean, to surrender himself, drove Frog's Meal, another dreadful pirate, to Manila, and finally, and within a few months, destroyed or dissipated the wasps of the ocean together. I have already noticed the mark intention of the Chinese historian to paint the character of Pao in a poetic or epic manner. When describing the battle with Shi Ul, he says, They fought from seven o'clock in the morning till one at noon, burnt ten vessels and killed an immense number of the pirates. Shi Ul was so weakened that he could scarcely make any opposition. On perceiving this through the smoke, Pao mounted on a sudden the vessel of the pirate, and cried out, I, Chang Pao, am come, and at the same moment he cut some pirate to pieces. The remainder were then hardly dealt with. Pao addressed himself in an angry tone to Shi Ul, and said, I advise you to submit. Will you not follow my advice? What have you to say? Shi Ul was struck with amazement, and his courage left him. Pao advanced and bound him, and the whole crew were then taken captives. From that period, says our Chinese historian, in conclusion, ships began to pass and repass in tranquillity. All became quiet on the rivers and tranquil on the four seas. People lived in peace and plenty. Men sold their arms and bought oxen to plough their field. They buried sacrifice and said prayers on top of the hills, and rejoiced themselves by singing behind screens during daytime, and, grand climax to all, the governor of the province, in consideration of all his valuable services in the pacification of the pirates, was allowed by an edict of the Son of Heaven to wear peacock's feathers with two eyes. End of chapter 18 The Pirate's Own Book by Charles Elms Chapter 19 The Life of Captain Lewis Captain Lewis was at an early age associated with pirates. We first find him a boy in company with the pirate Bannister, who was hanged at the yard-arm of a man-of-war, inside of Port Royal, Jamaica. This Lewis and another boy were taken with him, and brought into the island hanging by the middle at the Mizen Peak. He had a great aptitude for languages, and spoke perfectly well that of the most skilled Indians, French, Spanish, and English. I mention our own, because it is doubted whether he was French or English, for we cannot trace him back to his origin. He sailed out of Jamaica till he was a lusty lad, and was then taken by the Spaniards at the Havana, where he tarried some time. But at length he and six more ran away with a small canoe, and surprised a Spanish periagua, out of which two men joined them, 
so that they were now nine in company. With this periagua they surprised a turtling sloop, and forced some of the hands to take on with them. The others they sent away in the periagua. He played at this small game, surprising and taking coasters and turtlers, till with forced men and volunteers he made up a company of forty men. With these he took a large pink-built ship, bound for Jamaica to the Bay of Campeche, and after her several others bound to the same place. And having intelligence that there lay in the bay a fine Bermuda-built brigantine of ten guns, commanded by Captain Tucker, he sent the captain of the pink to him with a letter, the purport of which was that he wanted such a brigantine, and if he would part with her, he would pay him ten thousand pieces of eight. If he refused this, he would take care to lie in his way, for he was resolved, either by fair or foul means, to have the vessel. Captain Tucker, having read the letter, sent for the masters of vessels then lying in the bay, and told them, after he had shown the letter, that if they would make him up fifty-four men, for there were about ten Bermuda sloops, he would go out and fight the pirates. They said no, they would not hazard their men. They depended on their sailing, and every one must take care of himself as well as he could. However, they all put to sea together, and spied a sail under the land, which had a breeze while they lay becalmed. Some said he was a turtler, others the pirate, and so it proved, for it was honest Captain Lewis, who, putting out his oars, got in among them. Some of the sloops had four guns, some two, some none. Joseph Dill had two, which he brought on one side, and fired smartly at the pirate, but unfortunately one of them split, and killed three men. Tucker called to all the sloops to send him men, and he would fight Lewis, but to no purpose. Nobody came on board him. In the meanwhile a breeze sprung up, and Tucker, trimming his sails, left them, who all fell a prey to the pirate, into whom, however, he fired a broadside at going off. One sloop, whose master I will not name, was a very good sailor, and was going off. But Lewis, firing a shot, brought her to, and he lay by till all the sloops were visited and secured. Then Lewis sent on board him, and ordered the master into his sloop. As soon as he was on board, he asked the reason of him lying by, and betraying the trust his owners had reposed in him, which was doing like a knave and coward, and he would punish him accordingly. For, said he, you might have got off being so much a better sailor than my vessel. After this speech, he fell upon him with the rope's end, and then, snatching up his cane, drove him about the decks without mercy. The master, thinking to pacify him, told him he had been out trading in that sloop several months, and had on board a good quantity of money, which was hid, and which, if he would send on board a black belonging to the owners, he would discover to him. This had not the desired effect, but one quite contrary for Lewis told him he was a rascal and villain for this discovery, and he would pay him for betraying his owners, and redoubled his strokes. However, he sent and took the money and negro, who was an able sailor. He took out of his prizes what he had occasion for, forty able negro sailors, and a white carpenter. The largest sloop, which was about ninety tons, he took for his own use, and mounted her with twelve guns. His crew was now about eighty men, whites and blacks. After these captures, he cruised in the Gulf of Florida, laying in wait for the West India homeward-bound ships that took the leeward passage, several of which, falling into his hands, were plundered by him and released. From hence he went to the coast of Carolina, where he cleaned his sloop, and a great many men whom he had forced ran away from him. However, the natives traded with him for rum and sugar, and brought him all he wanted, without the government's having any knowledge of him, for he had got into a very private creek, though he was very much on his guard, that he might not be surprised from the shore. From Carolina he cruised on the coast of Virginia, where he took and plundered several merchantmen, and forced several men, and then returned to the coast of Carolina, where he did abundance of mischief. As he had now an abundance of French on board, who had entered with him, and Lewis, hearing the English had a design to maroon them, 
he secured the men he suspected, and put them in a boat, with all the other English, ten leagues from shore, with only ten pieces of beef, and sent them away, keeping none but French and Negroes. These men, it is supposed, all perished in the sea. From the coast of Carolina he shaped his course for the banks of Newfoundland, where he overhauled several fishing vessels, and then went into Trinity Harbor in Conception Bay, where there lay several merchantmen, and seized a twenty-four-gun galley called the Herman. The commander, Captain Beale, told Lewis if he would send his quartermaster ashore, he would furnish him with necessaries. He being sent ashore, a council was held among the masters, the consequence of which was the seizing the quartermaster, whom they carried to Captain Wode's Rogers. He chained him to a sheet-anchor which was ashore, and planted guns at the point to prevent the pirate getting out, but to little purpose, for the people at one of these points firing too soon, Lewis quitted the ship, and by the help of oars and the favour of the night, got out in his sloop, though she received many shot in her hull. The last shot that was fired at the pirate did him considerable damage. He lay off and on the harbour, swearing he would have his quartermaster, and intercepted two fishing shallops, on board of one of which was the captain of the galley's brother. He detained them, and sent word, if his quartermaster did not immediately come off, he would put all his prisoners to death. He was sent on board without hesitation. Lewis and the crew inquired how he had been used, and he answered very civilly, "'It's well,' said the pirate, "'for had you been ill-treated, I would have put all these rascals to the sword.' They were dismissed, and the captain's brother going over the side, the quartermaster stopped him, saying he must drink the gentleman's health ashore, particularly Captain Rogers's, and whispering him in the ear, told him, if they had known of his being chained all night, he would have been cut in pieces with all his men. After this poor man and his shallop's company were gone, the quartermaster told the usage he had met with which enraged Lewis, and made him reproach his quartermaster, whose answer was, that he did not think it just the innocent should suffer for the guilty. The masters of the merchantmen sent to Captain Tudor Trevor, who lay at St. John's in the Sheerness man-of-war. He immediately got under sail, and missed the pirate but four hours. She kept along the coast, and made several prizes, French and English and put into a harbour where a French ship lay making fish. She was built at the latter end of the war, for a privateer was an excellent sailor, and mounted twenty-four guns. The commander hailed him. The pirate answered from Jamaica with rum and sugar. The Frenchman bid him go about his business, that a pirate sloop was on the coast, and he might be the rogue. If he did not immediately sheer off, he would fire a broadside into him. He went off and lay a fortnight out at sea, so far as not to be descried from the shore, with resolution to have the ship. The Frenchman, being on his guard, in the meanwhile raised a battery on the shore, which commanded the harbour. After a fortnight, when he was thought to be gone off, he returned, and took two of the fishing shallops belonging to the Frenchman, and manning them with pirates, they went in. One shallop attacked the battery— the other surprised, boarded, and carried the ship, just as the morning star appeared, for which reason he gave her that name. In the engagement the owner's son was killed, who made the voyage out of curiosity only. The ship being taken, seven guns were fired, which was the signal, and the sloop came down and lay alongside the ship. The captain told him he supposed he only wanted his liquor, but Lewis made answer he wanted his ship and accordingly hoisted all his ammunition and provision into her. When the Frenchman saw they would have his ship, he told her trim, and Lewis gave him the sloop, and accepting what he took for provision, all the fish he had made. Several of the French took on with him, who with others, English and French, had by force or voluntarily made him up two hundred men. From Newfoundland he steered for the coast of Guinea, where he took a great many ships, English, Dutch, and Portuguese. Among these ships was one belonging to Carolina, commanded by Captain Smith. While he was in chase of this vessel, a circumstance occurred, which made his men believe he dealt with the devil. 
his fore and main top mast being carried away, he, Lewis, running up the shrouds to the main top, tore off a handful of hair, and throwing it into the air, used this expression Good devil, take this till I come. And it was observed that he came afterwards faster up with the chase than before the loss of his top masts. Smith being taken, Lewis used him very civilly, and gave him as much or more in value than he took from him, and let him go, saying he would come to Carolina when he had made money on the coast, and would rely on his friendship. They kept some time on the coast, when they quarrelled among themselves, the French and English, of which the former were more numerous, and they resolved to part. The French, therefore, chose a large sloop newly taken, thinking the ship's bottom, which was not sheathed, damaged by the worms. According to this agreement, they took on board what ammunition and provision they thought fit out of the ship, and put off, choosing one Labar captain. As it blew hard, and the decks were encumbered, they came to an anchor under the coast, to stow away their ammunition, goods, etc., Lewis told his men they were a parcel of rogues, and he would make them refund. Accordingly he run alongside, his guns being all loaded and new primed, and ordered him to cut away his mast, or he would sink him. Labar was obliged to obey. Then he ordered them all ashore. They begged the liberty of carrying their arms, goods, etc., with them, but he allowed them only their small arms and cartridge-boxes. Then he brought the sloop alongside, put everything on board the ship, and sunk the sloop. Labar and the rest begged to be taken on board. However, though he denied them, he suffered Labar and some few to come, with whom he and his men drank plentifully. The negroes on board Lewis told him the French had a plot against him. He answered he could not withstand his destiny, for the devil told him in the great cabin he should be murdered that night. In the dead of the night, the rest of the French came on board in canoes, got into the cabin, and killed Lewis. They fell on the crew, but after an hour and a half's dispute, the French were beaten off, and the quartermaster, John Cornelius, an Irishman, succeeded Lewis. He was the mildest-mannered man that ever scuttled ship or cut a throat. With such true breeding of a gentleman, you never could discern his real thought. Pity he loved an adventurous life's variety. He was so great a loss to good society. End of chapter 19 The Pirate's Own Book by Charles Elms Chapter 20 The Life, Career, and Death of Captain Thomas White He was born at Plymouth, where his mother kept a public house. She took great care of his education, and when he was grown up, as he had an inclination to the sea, procured him the king's letter. After he had served some years on board a man-of-war, he went to Barbados, where he married, got into the merchant service, and designed to settle in the island. He had the command of the marigold brigantine given to him, in which he made two successful voyages to Guinea and back to Barbados. In his third, he had the misfortune to be taken by a French pirate, as were several other English ships. The masters and inferior officers of which they detained being in want of good artist, the brigantine belonging to White, they kept for their own use, and sunk the vessel they before sailed in. But meeting with the ship on the Guinea coast more fit for their purpose, they went on board her and burnt the brigantine. It is not my business here to give an account of this French pirate. Any further than Captain White's story obliges me, though I beg leave to take notice of their barbarity to the English prisoners, for they would set them up as a butt or mark to shoot at several of whom were thus murdered in cold blood by way of diversion white was marked out for a sacrifice by only of these villains who for what reason i know not had sworn his death which he escaped thus one of the crew who had a friendship for white knew this fellow's design to kill him in the night and therefore advised him to lie between him and the ship's side with intention to save him which indeed he did but was himself shot by the murderous villain who mistook him for white after some time cruising along the coast the pirates doubled the cape of good hope and shaped their course for madagascar where being drunk and mad they knocked their ship on the head at the south end of the island at a place called by the natives alexa the country thereabouts was governed by a king 
name of Faley. When the ship struck, Captain White, Captain Borman, born in the Isles of Wight, formerly a lieutenant of a man of war, but in the merchant service when he fell into the hands of the pirates, Captain Bowen and some other prisoners got into the longboat, and with broken oars and barrel staves, which they found in the bottom of the boat, paddled to Augustine Bay, which is about fourteen or fifteen leagues from the wreck where they landed and were kindly received by the king of Bavaw, the name of that part of the island, who spoke good English. They stayed here a year and a half at the king's expense, who gave them a plentiful allowance of provisions, as was his custom to all white men, who met with any misfortunes on his coast. His humanity not only provided for such, but the first European vessel that came in he always obliged to take in the unfortunate people. Let the vessel be what it would, for he had no notion of any difference between pirates and merchants. At the expiration of the above term, a pirate brigantine came in, on board which the king obliged them to enter, or travel by land to some other place, which they durst not do, and of two evils chose the least, that of going on board the pirate vessel, which was commanded by one William Reed, who received them very civilly. This commander went along the coast and picked up what Europeans he could meet with. His crew, however, did not exceed forty men. He would have been glad of taking some of the wrecked Frenchmen, but for the barbarity they had used towards the English prisoners, however, it was impracticable. For the French, pretending to lord it over the natives, whom they began to treat inhumanely, were set upon by them, one half of their number cut off, and the other half made slaves. Reed, with his gang and a brigantine of sixty tons, steered his course for the Persian Gulf, where they met a grab, a one-mast vessel of about two hundred tons, which was made a prize. They found nothing on board but bale goods, most of which they threw overboard in search of gold, and to make room in the vessel, but as they learned afterwards, they threw over, in their search, what they so greedily hunted for for there was a considerable quantity of gold concealed in one of the bales they tossed into the sea in this cruise captain reed fell ill and died and was succeeded by one james the brigantine being small crazy and worm-eating they shaped their course for the island of Mayotta, where they took at the mass of the brigantine fitted up the grab and made a ship of her here they took in a quantity of fresh provisions which are in this island very plentiful and very cheap and found a twelve-oared boat which formerly belonged to the ruby east indian men which had been lost there they stayed here all the monsoon time which is about six months after which they resolved for madagascar as they came in with the land they spied a sail coming round from the east side of the island they gave chase on both sides so that they soon met they hailed each other and receiving the same answer from each vessel viz from the other seas they joined company this vessel was a small French ship laden with liquors from Martinico, first commanded by one Forge to trade for the pirates with slaves at Ambonavala, on the east side of the island, in the latitude of seventeen degrees thirty minutes, and was by them taken over by the following manner. The pirates, who were headed by George Booth, now commander of the ship, went on board, as they had often done, to the number of ten, and carried money with them under pretense of purchasing what they wanted. This booth had formerly been gunner of a pirate ship, called the Dolphin Captain Forget, who was pretty much upon his guard, and searched every man as he came over the side, and a pair of pocket pistols were found upon a Dutchman, who was the first that entered. The captain told him that he was a rogue, and had design upon his ship, and the pirates pretended to be so angry with this fellow's offering to come on board with arms that they threatened to knock him on the head, and tossing him roughly into the boat, ordered him ashore though they had before taken an oath on bible either to carry the ship or die in the undertaking they were all searched but they however contrived to get on board four pistols which were all the arms they had for the enterprise though forche had twenty hands on board and his small arms on the awning to be in readiness the captain invited them into the cabin to dinner but booth chose to dine with the petty officer the one johnson isaac and another went down booth was to give the watchword which was hurrah standing near the awning and being a nimble fellow at one spring he threw himself upon it drew the arms to him fired his pistol among the men one of whom he wounded who jumping overboard was lost and gave the signal three i said were in the cabin and seven upon deck who with handspikes and the arms seized secured the ship's crew 
the captain and his two mates who were at dinner in the cabin hearing the pistol fell upon johnson and stabbed him in several places with their forks but they being silver did him no great damage bourget snatched his piece which he snapped at isaac's breast several times but it would not go off at last finding his resistance vain he submitted and the pirates set him and those of his men who would not join them on shore allowing him to take his books papers and whatever else he claimed as belonging to himself and besides treating him very humanely gave him several casks of liquor and arms and powder to purchase provisions in the country i hope this discretion as it was in a manner needful will be excused i shall now proceed after they had taken in the dolphin's company which were on the island and increased their crew by that means to the number of eighty hands they had sailed to st mary's where captain mawson's ship lay at anchor between the island and the main this gentleman and his whole ship's company had been cut off at the instigation of ort van til a dutchman of new york out of her they took water cask and other necessaries which having done they designed for the river methelage on the west side of madagascar in the latitude of sixteen degrees or thereabouts to salt up provisions and to proceed to the east indies cruise off the islands of st john and lie in wait for the moor ships for Mocha. in their way to methelage they fell in as i have said with the pirate on board of which was captain white they joined company came to an anchor together in the above-named river where they had cleaned salted and took in their provisions and were ready to go to sea when a large ship appeared in sight and stood into the same river the pirates knew not whether she was a merchantman or man of war she had been the latter belonging to the french king and could mount fifty guns but being taken by the english she was bought by some london merchants and fitted out from that port to slave at madagascar and go to jamaica the captain was a young inexperienced man who was put in with a nurse the pirates sent their boats to speak with them but the ship firing at them they concluded it a man of war and rowed ashore the grab standing in and not keeping her wind so well as the french built ship run among a parcel of mangroves and a stump piercing her bottom she sunk the other run aground let go her anchor and came to no damage for the tide of flood fetched her off the captain of the speaker for that was the name of the ship which frightened the pirates was not a little vain of having forced these two vessels ashore though he did not know whether they were pirates or merchantmen and could not help expressing himself in these words how will my name ring on the exchange when it is known i have run two pirates aground which gave handel to a satirical return from one of his men after he was taken who said lord how our captain's name will ring on the exchange when it is heard he frightened two pirate ships ashore and was taken by their boats afterwards when the speaker came within shot she fired several times at the two vessels and when she came to anchor several more into the country which alarmed the negroes who acquainting their king he would allow him no trade to the pirates living ashore and who had a design on his ship interceded for them telling the king they were their countrymen and what had happened was through a mistake it being a custom among them to fire their guns by way of respect and it was owing to the gunner of the ship's negligence that they fired shot the captain of the speaker sent his purser ashore to go up the country to the king who lived about twenty-four miles from the coast to carry a couple of small arms inlaid with gold a couple of brass blunderbusses and a pair of pistols as presents and to require trade as soon as the purser was ashore he was taken prisoner by one tom collins a welshman born in pembroke who lived on shore and had belonged to the charming mary of barbados which went out with a commission but was converted to a pirate he told the purser he was his prisoner and must answer the damage done to two merchants who were slaving the purser answered that he was not commander that the captain was a hot rash youth put into business by his friends which he did not understand but however satisfaction should be made he was carried by collins on board booth's ship where at first he was talked to in pretty strong terms but after a while very civilly used and the next morning sent up to the king with a guide and peace made for him the king allowed them trade and sent down the usual presents a couple of oxen between twenty and thirty people laden with rice and as many more with the country liquor called toke the captain then settled the factory on the shore side and began to buy slaves and provisions the pirates were among them and had opportunities of sounding the men and knowing in what posture the ship lay they found by one human belonging to the speaker that there were not above forty men on board 
and that they had lost the second mate and twenty hands in the longboat on the coast before they came into this harbor but that they kept a good lookout and had their guns ready primed however he for a hundred pounds undertook to wet all the priming and assist in taking the ship after some days the captain of the speaker came on shore and was received with great civility by the heads of the pirates having agreed before to make satisfaction and a day or two after he was invited by them to eat a barbecued show which invitation he accepted after dinner captain bowen who was i have already said a prisoner on board the french pirate but now become one of the fraternity and master of the grab went out and returned with a case of pistols in his hand and told the captain of the speaker whose name i won't mention that he was his prisoner he asked upon what account bowen answered they wanted his ship his was a good one and they were resolved to have her to make amends for the damage he had done them in the meanwhile his boat's crew and the rest of the men ashore were told by others of the pirates who were drinking with them that they were also prisoners some of them answered zounds we don't trouble our heads what we are let's have to other bowl of punch a watchword was given and no boat to be admitted on the ship this word which was for that night coventry was known to them at eight o'clock they manned the twelve-oared boat and the one they found at myota with twenty-four men and set out for the ship when they were put off the captain of the speaker desired them to come back as they wanted to speak with them captain booth asked what he wanted he said they could never take his ship then said booth will die in or alongside of her but replied the captain if you will go with safety don't board on the larboard side for there is a gun out of the steerage loaded with partridge which will clear the docks they thanked him and proceeded when they were near the ship they were hailed and the answer was the coventry all well said the mate get the lights over the side but spying the second boat he asked what boat that was one answered it was a raft of water another that it was a boat of beef this disagreement in the answers made the mate suspicious who cried out pirates take your arms my lads and immediately clapped a match to a gun which as the primary was before wet by the treachery of human only fizzed they boarded in the instant and made themselves masters of her without the loss of a man on either side the next day they put necessary provisions on board the french built ship and gave her to the captain of the speaker and those men who would go off with him among whom was man who had betrayed his ship for the pirates had both paid him the one hundred i agreed and kept his secret the captain having thus lost his ship sailed in that which the pirates gave him for johanna where he fell ill and died with grief the pirates having here victualled they sailed for the bay of st augustine where they took in between seventy and eighty men who had belonged to the ship alexander commanded by captain james a pirate they also took up her guns and mounted the speaker with fifty-four which made up their number and two hundred and forty men besides slaves of which they had about twenty from hence they sailed for the east indies but they stopped at zagabar for fresh provisions where the portuguese had once a settlement but now inhabited by arabians some of them went ashore with the captain to buy provisions the captain was sent for by the governor who went with about fourteen in company they passed through the guard and where they had entered the governor's house they were all cut off and at the same time others who were in different houses in the town were set upon which made them fly to the shore the longboat which lay off a grappling was immediately put in by those who looked after her or there were not above half a dozen of the pirates who brought their arms ashore but they piled them so well for they were in the boat that most of the men got into her the quartermaster ran down sword in hand and though he was attacked by many he behaved himself so well that he got into a little canoe put off and reached the longboat in the interim the little fort the arabians had played upon the ship which returned the salute very warmly thus they got on board with the loss of captain booth and twenty men and set sail for the east indies when they were under sail they went to voting for a new captain and the quartermaster who had behaved so well in the last affair with the arabians was chosen but he declining all command the crew made choice of bowen for captain pickering to succeed him as master samuel harrat a frenchman for quartermaster and nathaniel north for captain quartermaster 
things being thus settled they came to the mouth of the red sea and fell in with thirteen sail of more ships which they kept company with the greater part of the day but afraid to venture on them as they took them for portuguese men of war at length part were for boarding and advised it the captain though he said little did not seem inclined for he was but a young pirate though an old commander of a merchantman those who pushed for boarding then desired captain borman already mentioned to take the command but he said he would not be an usurper that nobody was more fit for it than he who had it that for his part he would stand by his foozle and went forward to the forecastle with such as would have him take the command to be ready to board on which the captain's quartermaster said if they were resolved to engage their captain whose representative he was did not want resolution therefore ordered them to get their tacks on board for they had already made a clear ship and get ready for boarding which they accordingly did and coming up with the sternmost ship they fired a broadside into her which killed two moors clapped her on board and carried her but night coming on they made only this prize which yielded them five hundred pound per man from hence they sailed to the coast of malabar the adventures of these pirates on this coast are already set down in captain bowen's life to which i refer the reader and shall only observe that captain white was all this time before the mast being a forced man from the beginning bowen's crew dispersing captain white went to methelodge where he lived ashore with the king not having an opportunity of getting off the island till another pirate ship called the prosperous commanded by one howard who had been bred a letterman on the river thames came in this ship was taken at augustine by some pirates from shore and the crew of their longboat which joined them at the instigation of one ranton boatswain mate who sent for water they came on board in the night and surprised her though not without resistance in which the captain and chief mate were killed and several others wounded those who were ashore with captain white resolving to enter in this ship determined him to go also rather than be left alone with the natives hoping by some accident or other to have an opportunity of returning home he continued on board the ship in which he was made quartermaster till they met with and all went on board of bowen as is set down in his life in which ship he continued after bowen left them at port dolphin he went off in the boats to fetch some of the crew ashore the ship being blown to sea the night before the ship not being able to get in and he supposing her gone to the west side of the island as they had formerly proposed he steered that course in the boat with twenty-six men they touched at augustine expecting the ship but she not appearing in a week the time they waited the king ordered them to be gone telling them they imposed on him with lies for he did not believe they had any ship however he gave them fresh provision they took in water and made for methelodge here as captain white was known to the king they were kindly received and stayed about a fortnight in expectation of the ship but she not appearing they raised their boat a streak salted the provision the king gave them put water aboard and stood for the north end of the island designing to go around believing their ship might be at the island of st mary when they came to the north end the current which sets to the northwest for eight months in the year was so strong they found it impossible to get round wherefore they got into a harbor of which there are many for small vessels here they stayed about three weeks or a month when part of the crew were for burning the boat and travelling over land to a black king of their acquaintance whose name was Rebberembo, who lived at a place called manangoromazai in latitude fifteen degrees or thereabouts as this king had been several times assisted by whites in his wars he was a great friend to them captain white dissuaded them from his undertaking and with much ado saved the boat but one half of the men being resolved to go by land they took what provisions they thought necessary and set out captain white and those who stayed with him conveyed them a day's journey and then returning he got into the boat with his companions and went back to methelodge fearing these men might return prevail with the rest and burn the boat here he built a deck on his boat and lay by three months in which time there came in three pirates with a boat who had formerly been trepanned on board the severn and scarborough men-of-war which had been looking for pirates on the east side from which ships they made their escape at mohila in a small canoe to johanna and from johanna to myota where the king built them the boat which brought them to methelodge the time of the current setting with violence to the northwest being over they proceeded together in white's boat burning that of myota to the north end where the current running yet too strong to get around they went into a harbor and stayed there a month 
maintaining themselves with fish and wild hogs of which there was a great plenty at length having fine weather and the strength of the current abating they got round and after sailing about forty miles on the east side they went into a harbour where they found a piece of a jacket which they knew belonged to one of those men who had left them to go over land he had been a forced man and a ship carpenter this they supposed he had torn to wrap round his feet that part of the country being barren and rocky as they sailed along the coast they came to anchor in convenient harbours every night till they got as far as manangoromazai where king reberimbo resided where they went in to acquire for their men who left them at the north end and to recruit with provisions the latter was given them but they could get no information of their companions from hence they went to the island of st mary where a canoe came off to them with a letter directed to any white man they knew it to be the hand of one of their former shipmates the contest of this letter was to advise them to be on their guard and not trust too much to the blacks of this place they having been formerly treacherous they inquired after their ship and were informed that the company had given her to the moors who were gone away with her and that they themselves were settled at ambonovola about twenty leagues to the southward of st mary where they lived among the negroes as so many sovereign princes one of the blacks who brought off the letter went on board their boat carried them to the place called olumba a point of land made by a river on one side and the sea on the other where twelve of them lived together in a large house they had built and fortified with about twenty pieces of cannon the rest of them were settled in small companies of about twelve or fourteen together more or less up the said river and along the coast every nation by itself as the english french dutch and sea they made inquiry of the consorts after the different prizes which belonged to them and they found all very justly laid to be given them if ever they returned as were that belonged to the men who went over land captain white hankering after home proposed going out again in the boat for he was adverse to settling with them and many others agreed to go under his command and if they could meet with the ship to carry them to europe to follow their old vacation but the others did not think it reasonable he should have the boat but that it should be set to sail for the benefit of the company accordingly it was set up and captain white bought it for four hundred pieces of eight and with some of his old consorts whose number was increased by the other of the ship's crew he went back the way he had come to methelage here he met with a french ship of about fifty tons and six guns which had been taken by some pirates who lived at Maratan, on the east side of the island and some of the de grave east indiaman's crew to whom the master of her refused a passage to europe for as he had himself been a pirate and quartermaster to bowen and the speaker he apprehended their taking away his ship war then existing between england and france he thought they might do it without being called in question as pirates the pirates who had been concerned in taking herald's ship for that was his name had gone up the country and left her to the men belonging to the de grave who had fitted her up cleaned and tallowed her and got in some provision with a design to go to the east indies that they might light on some ship to return to their own country captain white finding these men proposed joining him and going round to ambonovola to make up a company it was agreed upon and they unanimously chose him commander they accordingly put to sea and stood away round the south end of the island and touched at don mascarenas where he took in a surgeon and stretching over again to madagascar fell in with ambonavala and made up his complement of sixty men from hence he shaped his course for the island of Mayota, where he cleaned his ship and waited for the season to go into the red sea his provisions being taken in the time proper and the ship well fitted he steered for babo mandeb and running into a harbour waited for the maca ships he here took two grabs laden with provisions and having some small money and drugs aboard these he plundered of what was for his turn kept them a fortnight by him and let them go soon after they espied a lofty ship upon which they put to sea but finding her european built and too strong to attempt for it was a dutchman they gave over the chase and were glad to shake them off and returned to their station fancying they were here discovered from the coast of arabia or that the grabs had given information of them stood over the ethiopian shore keeping a good look out for the maca ships a few days after they met with a large ship of about one thousand tons and six hundred men called the malabar which they chased 
kept company with her all night and took in the morning with the loss of only their boatswain and two or three men wounded in taking the ship they damaged their own so much by springing their foremast carrying away their bowsprit and beating in part of their upper works that they did not think her longer fit for their use they therefore filled her away with prisoners gave them provisions and sent them away some days after this they espied a portuguese man-of-war of forty-four guns which they chased but gave it over by carrying away their main topmast so that they did not speak with her for the portuguese took no notice of them four days after they had left this man-of-war they fell in with a portuguese merchantman which they chased with english colors flying the chase taking white for an english man-of-war or east indian man made no sail to get from him but on his coming up bought to and sent his boat on board with a present of sweet meats for the english captain his boat's crew was detained and the pirates getting into the boat with their arms went on board and fired on the portuguese who being surprised asked if war was broke out between england and portugal they answered in the affirmative but the captain could not believe them however they took what they liked and kept him with them after two days they met with the dorothy an english ship captain penredoc commander coming from mocha they exchanged several shots in the chase but when they came alongside of her they entered their men and found no resistance she being navigated by moors no europeans except the officers being on board on a vote they gave captain penredoc from whom they took a considerable quantity of money the portuguese ship and cargo with what bail he pleased to take out of his own bid him go about his business and make what he could of her as to the english ship they kept her for their own use soon after they plundered the malabar ship out of which they took as much money as came to two 